Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Johnny McMahon. Oh, yeah! We're proud to have the Iron Show right here on Fringe Radio Network. That's FringeRadioNetwork.com. And I'm proud to know you, Bruce Collins. You rock! breakfast with your family and your wife is reading the newspaper and you're drinking your coffee and she finds your ad in the personal section rabbi seeking young wench for unmeaningful relationship does it make you cry no, Johnny, because she knows you and she knows who placed the ad and that it wasn't me. Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah, it was a setup, baby! Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. We are here tonight. We are honored to be here tonight with uh, Mr. Big, Mr. Hollywood, screenwriter, author, prolific author, Brian Gadawa. What's up? Oh, yeah. Now, Brian, uh, you know, I had doubted previously that you were man enough to be on the Iron Show. So <laughs> He was. He was completely <laughs> like, Brian's not going to show. <laughs> so you're going to have to prove your manhood, and here's how we do it. Oh, Brian, will you sing the La La song with me? La, 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 la. <laughs> La la la. La, la la la. Oh yeah, you're a man. Oh yeah. La la la. La la la. La la la. Oh yeah. Oh, you you rock, dude. You are like right on top of that. You are not like the bass player, the uh, Fringe Radio Network bass player who never knows when to come in. So anyway, um, so we are here tonight with Brian Gadawa. Like I said, he is a prolific uh, author, scre- screenwriter, Mr. Big, Mr. Hollywood. He was busy hanging out, um, smoking pot with Val Kilmer, and we drug him in here. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. Go, go, go! It's the West Coast, baby. I had to do it. I had to do it. No, that's, I'm joking. I made that all up. That's just like total fiction. But it sounds kind of cool, though, doesn't it? It was medical. Oh, it was medical! It's medicinal, I swear. It's medicinal. <laughs> medicinal. You know, we were, you know, um, Mongolian barbecue has always been really big on the Iron Show. You know, we would sit there going, ah, ah, Mongolian, Mongolian. And uh, I was thinking that you, even though you're such a big time Hollywood screenwriter and author, I thought that maybe perhaps you had missed your calling in life because of your last name. You could have been a really great Mongolian barbecue chef. Because you could have been Brian Kadama. Kadama. Actually, actually, true story. When I was in high school, I was a gymnast. Now, this was many, many decades ago when the Japanese were were the hottest thing in the Olympics in gymnastics. And whenever I would get up, people would often think I was I was Japanese, and then be shocked and surprised. Kadama. Wait a minute. That's Polish. <laughs> oh, what? Yeah. What is the origin of Kadama? It's actually Gadava, which okay. is uh, Polish. And I think it might be connected to Godiva, 
but let's not get naked about it. Oh, cool. <laughs> you know, you're on the Iron Show now, naked. There's just, like, like we don't have rules here on the Iron Show. You know, if you want to eat um, some nachos, you know, some chips and salsa, you know, or some greasy chicken. Yeah. Oh, it's, oh, yeah. We have no rules. We have no rules on the Iron Show. But, uh, hey, um, we brought you on here. Because, because thankfully, we are audio only. Yeah. <laughs> we're only in trouble. I am way... Because I'm in my underwear, so... Nice! <laughs> no, <laughs> underwear and thongs. He's, uh, Brian's wearing flip-flops right wearing now. Wearing his leotard. And I must tell you, we're, all, we're on the West Coast. Me and Brian are on the West Coast, so I, too, am wearing flip-flops. And uh, I'm hanging out on the West Coast. Rabbi Mike is clear on the East Coast. He is down there in Georgia. The peach Georgia. Yeah. And, and uh, interesting point in connection. I actually did gymnastics when I was a kid. Um, ended up dropping out as a team because I couldn't find a team anywhere within like a hundred mile radius. But I really enjoyed it. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, cool. Having our ex-gymnast in here who probably went way farther than I did. I was kinda... Well, we, we, were in, we gymnasts would, would look down with contempt upon all the other sports people. We would say, gymnastics is the only sport. All the rest are games. That's right. Yeah, that's pretty much true. I was at the opposite end of the spectrum. I, I became a confirmed Catholic in seventh grade so I could play full-on tackle football for St. Anthony's. And uh, I, I remember going through confirmation, and my best friend Andy Nixon. I was why he was in front of me, and I, he he turns over and winks at me, and looks down. And I look down. And he's got his fingers crossed behind his back while he's going through confirmation. Oh, <laughs> that's bad. Oh, sacrilege! Sacrilege! Johnny one upped him by going with the you know devil's horns behind his back. There, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> seventh grade. Seventh grade. Um, Catholic confirmation. What year was that for Johnny? It was nineteen. 19- 74, when it was still hardcore, you know, the priest was there, do you renounce Satan? And you're like, yes, sir. <laughs> yes, yes, we please hurt this up. I've got Dungeons and Dragons game to go play. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. We are here tonight, though, to talk about Brian's book and probably, like, talk a lot of, like, about a lot of things. Um, um, hey, I, I just wanted to say, um, you know, Brian, I actually almost met you in person. A few years really? ago in L.A., yeah. I don't know if you remember, but you 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 had your books out there on this big table, and there's like a hundred million people. Like literally, there was probably probably oh, a good fifty people standing in line to meet you and talk to you and shake your hand because you know you're Mr. Big and everything. And so I'm walking by, you know, and you looked over at the top of everybody at me, and you're like, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Really? This, wait, wait. What was this? Uh, what was this? A conference or something? Yeah, it was. A, it was in L.A., Orange County, at the Canary Cry Bird Conference there. Oh yeah, I remember that conference. Yeah, okay, gotcha. I was there. gotcha. Maybe, maybe you looked. Like, maybe you looked familiar, but yeah, it was like you knew I who I was. Know. It was like you were looking at me. Everybody, people were trying to talk to you, but you were looking over the tops of their heads at me. You're like, hey, dude, that's hey. that must be what it is. I bet you, I thought you were someone else. Oh, <laughs> dude. <laughs> All right. I hate to uh, burst your bubble, but sorry. Well, Brian, um, it was really nice to have you here tonight on the Iron Show. And could you tell us about your book? And uh... <laughs> bye bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. That would have been a, a few years ago. I'm still going to ask the hard questions that the that the predominantly premillennial audience here is is going to want to ask. So, yes, um, yes. but I, I actually actually am sort of. I think you're about half right. I just think you're missing something. But I, I am gotcha. going to ask the questions and give you a chance to uh, take away the answers because I think it'll make a good discussion. But Rabbi cool. Mike, you remember that we agreed that this would not be a brutal debate. You would not. No, be no, no, no. I, the brutality has been set to the side. Right I, here. I'm here to ask the questions to give Brian a chance to present his view and and that kind of thing. So yes, we're here uh, to again, talk. I, I'm actually, I actually, I think he's got a point. I, I, just, I think there's something he's missing, and I'm not going to sit there and try to hammer on that home tonight. Um, but. Sure. Uh, it, th- this is an area that uh, there is a reason why uh, his position uh, does exist, yeah. and why uh, and why uh, uh, so many hold to it. And um, you know, me, me, I take sort of, you know, I come from sort of that, that rabbinic background of uh, believing that you can have many different positions on a given passage of scripture. So, sure. Uh, yeah. The point here is not to have a beat down or anything like that, but. Since there are going to be people that are going to have questions, I'm going to try to anticipate the sort of questions they want to ask because I've read your work here, and I think you, I know that you've got uh, some uh, good and interesting answers there. So. Yes. Oh, cool. And, well, thank you. 
And Brian, the more I learn, the less I know. Um, there are people here, <laughs> <laughs> listeners to the Iron. <laughs> Amen. No, really, man. I mean, if I can say my one thing yeah, before we please. start discussing, and is you know, I've gone through a long journey with this myself. I've had, I've held all millennial positions, so I've you know studied them all different parts of my life. And the one thing that I've concluded, even though I do hold what I hold with conviction, uh, I hold it with a with a, a very open hand to God, knowing that I've been wrong in the past, so I can be wrong now. And sadly, I think that this issue, particularly what I've found now that I've kind of embarking in the issue because of my books, I'm seeing that there's just a lot of, of um, I don't know what to call it, but uh, emotional outrage and reactions to people mm. who don't agree, don't agree with me. Not just my viewpoint. I'm just saying everybody who doesn't agree with everybody on prophecy, I've seen so much uh, hostility. And, and you know, I, I've had to really look at myself and say, hey, you got to make sure you're cool. You cool down about it and don't don't do the same thing and try to just, you know, have a good discussion with people. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all for that, too. But I want to talk about the novel first, because no yeah. matter what you believe, it's an awesome novel. Oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> It is. Dude, I'm yeah. only about halfway through it as of this because I had only about a week and it's been a busy week, but it's it thir thoroughly enjoyable. So jump right in there. Uh, how would you sum up the novel? You know, if you're if you've got your you know elevator pitch that you're uh, uh, explaining to somebody. Actually, yeah, first, so first, I just there's listeners that don't know who you are. Um, Brian Gadawa is um, he's an author. He's a screenwriter. He wrote the screenplay for the famous movie To End All Wars with Kiefer Sutherland. Sort of like the bridge over the River Kwai. It's really cool. Cool. Um, I've seen it a few times. It's a pretty awesome movie. Uh, Brian wrote that. Um, he he wrote um, the list of his books includes Noah Primeval, Enoch Primordial, Gilgamesh Immortal, Abraham Allegiant, Joshua Valiant, Caleb Vigilant, David Ascendant, Jesus Triumphant, Jerusalem Judgment, and his new book Tyrant, which rocks. I mean, it's <laughs> like it reminds me of sort of like. It's sort of like when I'm reading it, it's sort of like I'm watching like Conan the Barbarian. These are the days of high adventure. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I mean, I got ADD and I can't read books, but I can read this one. I'm slowly working my way through it. And it's just, cool. and it, it puts you in a place like when I'm reading it, I can see all the places and mm -hmm. stuff, which is a huge gift. So um, look, people, you will like this book. I mean, I would urge you, even if you don't read books, you're like me, you will absolutely love this book. And you can also get it on audiobook later on. It'll come out later. But, uh, yeah, Brian Gadawa, Tyrant, is the name of the book. So, Rabbi well, Mike, if I could turn it back. Oh, no, go ahead. Yeah, I was just say, as a prelude then, um, yeah, you know, I've been in, I've been in Hollywood for many years, um, writing movies. And interestingly, this journey began about six years ago when I was writing a screenplay for, um, for a movie that I thought, okay, I got a Bible story that no one's ever done. And I did research into it and it was so cool. I thought, oh man, even Hollywood wouldn't want to make this movie. And the, the, the script I wrote was about Noah. And then of course, shortly after then I found out Darren Aronofsky was making his movie on Noah. And at the time I thought, I didn't know, I didn't, you know, I didn't know the script or anything. I just thought, man, if he knows what I know, he's going to beat me to the punch with the coolest stuff. So I figured, well, I might as well adapt my screenplay into a novel, and that became Noah Primeval. And I, so it got out long before his movie did, but lo and behold, his movie was terrible and had hardly any connection to, to my research that I had found on, on uh, the story of Noah, you know. And the story that sort of opened it up for me was this Genesis 6 passage about the sons of God mating with the daughters of men and the Nephilim giants and all that stuff that I'm sure uh, your hearers have, uh, you know, heard about and discussed about. But for me, as an evangelical uh, and a reformed Christian, you know, I still hold a high view of scripture. And so but discovering that storyline opened up the scriptures to me. I also tended to be sort of less supernaturalistic, if I can say, in my worldview, you know. And, and you know, I mean, I think a lot of us Christians are because we're hammered all the time with this scientific culture, a scientist culture, 
scientism culture, sorry, yeah. you know, and materialism. And, and, you know, we start to think that way without even realizing it, right? And so this supernatural worldview, which basically opened up in the Bible to me that this notion that, you know, they're in the Bible and, you know, we, 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 we see glimpses in like Daniel where you, you hear about, you know, the prince of Persia or uh, basically the spiritual authority over Persia fighting with this prince of, of Greece and the prince of Israel, Michael. And these are angelic heavenly hosts. And it's this notion that goes all the way back to Deuteronomy. 32, where it talks about how um, after Babel, when God split up the, the nations, it says that he, he placed them under the authority of the sons of God. And, and you know, studying that notion comes out that basically in, 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 in likens with uh, Romans 1, where God gives, over, gives them over to their sin, basically God was saying, you, you guys, you know, I, I do the flood. You still don't worship me. You'd create the Tower of Babel. So I'm going to split you up. I'm going to give you what you want. I'm going to place you under the authority of these, of these um, um, false gods, basically, you know, these heavenly hosts that you're going to worship. And you're going to be under their authority, but I'm going to, I'm going to hold for me and my inheritance is going to be Jacob, right? So there's this bit ancient biblical and ancient Near Eastern notion that all, all the nations over all the nations, there are spiritual authorities. And so when you hear about a battle on earth, their belief was that there's also a battle in the heavenlies because there's a, the, the authorities on earth are tied uh, inextricably to the authorities in heaven. And that's where we get this notion in Daniel with, with what's going on. And then all the way into the New Testament where Paul talks about we fight not against or fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in the heavenly places. And it's this notion that, you know, don't, you know, realize that there's a bigger picture than what you see in the flesh. You're being persecuted on this earth, but there are principalities and powers behind those authorities that are more important with the scene that's going on. So this is the sort of supernatural worldview that I was heavily influenced by Michael Heiser's work. And I don't know if you know about him, but yeah, you know, he's, he's an evangelical <laughs> scholar. On the show once. Yeah, he's been oh, on the show. Okay, great. Yeah. So anyway, that's, that's sort of the, uh, and then that, what that did was though, when I, when I opened up that, that, uh, can of worms, so to speak, I, it blew me away and I saw the Bible in a fresh new way. And I saw this storyline of the war of the sea, the seed of the serpent and the seed of Eve. And so I basically retold Bible stories where giants or watchers came up in the Bible. And, you know, I used a lot of fiction, obviously, but I tried to stay true to the Bible. So I, I, I basically created an eight novel series called Chronicles of the Nephilim. And that Noah primeval was the first one. And then it went on to Enoch and Abraham and Joshua and Caleb and David all the way to Jesus. And and um, so that was the that was the launching point, and this worldview um, uh, was sort of launched that, and that was the imaginative application of theology while trying to stay true to the biblical. Uh, the, you know, truth that I, as I understood it, I still wanted to show the spiritual world that we don't see and what might that look like type of thing. Mm -hmm. So I have those both worlds going on. And, and then I thought my series was ended, but I realized years ago for, you know, I studied the issue of, of uh, the last days and end times and stuff. And, and I had um, uh, years earlier, I had become influenced by the work of uh, various preterists is what they call them, um, such as Ken Gentry and Gary DeMar. And so their writings influenced me years ago, but I kind of have never been big on prophecy. It's sort of like I studied that issue and, and now I have these new beliefs, but I've always focused more on, you know, gospel, trying to get the truth out as I understood it, whatever. I, and, and I didn't get wrapped up in all these, you know, who's going to be the antichrist and all this kind of stuff. But I study that stuff and I suddenly realized that it all started to make sense with this supernatural worldview. And I had one more series to write. And that's what this series is. It's called Chronic that one was called Chronicles of the Nephilim. This one's called Chronicles of the Apocalypse. And basically the story takes place um, uh, a generation after uh, the resurrection. And it's right after the book of Acts. And it basically, the, the story that I tell is the story of... Uh, the the uh, the original persecution of Christians by Nero. It starts with the the great fire of Rome, and it and it goes into this this story of Nero, and it ultimately talks about the Jewish revolt that happened in 66 A.D. that led up to the final destruction of the temple and the and and Jerusalem in 70 A.D. And this story is is something that a lot of Christians don't know about because we're 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 not usually taught much about it but I think it has I've come to believe that it has a very very important spiritual theological meaning in 
not only Christianity, but in Judaism and everything. And so that was the story I wanted to tell. But I don't want to, I, I write theological novels, but I, because of my Hollywood background, I, I'm not into like, you know, boring theological, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> attempts to, to, to make drama into a sermon. You know what I mean? Like there's yeah. when th theologians try to tell stories. They're really bad at it. Right. So I bring my <laughs> Hollywood sensibility to it and I go, okay, I want to tell an entertaining story. So that's my priority. And I want to educate Christians. Uh, and I want to educate people to what really happened. So I wanted to be historically accurate as well as theological, but also have an entertaining story. So the first novel in the series, Chronicles of the Apocalypse, is Tyrant, Rise of the Beast. And the basic logline is it's Rome, 19, or AD 64, right? And a Roman prefect and his Jewish servant are ordered by the evil emperor Nero to track down a secret Christian document that – undermines the Roman Empire and predicts the end of the world. But they're not prepared for the spiritual warfare they've unleashed. And this is this is my the truth, the origin of the most controversial book of the Bible, Revelation. And I wrote it like a historical conspiracy thriller like Dan Brown with angels and demons. And that's that's the sort of story side of it, right? Mm -hmm. And um that's what that and so that's what this book this first book is, is is all about so i go into the i show the spiritual side of things as well as the human story and like i said i'm trying to be as true as i can even though i'm adding a lot of you know i'm i am making fi a lot of things up fiction wise but trying to remain true but there's another aspect of ancient history and that is if when you study it you find out there's not a lot of certainties in a lot of things, you know, so you gotta, you gotta do guesswork. And, um, there are different scholarly viewpoints on both sides of the issue for a lot of historical, even historical events. Right. So, um, but that's, that's what tyrant becomes, but it also is ultimately a, a, uh, a narrative version of my view of the end times. Mm -hmm. What, what you may say, the end cool. times, but I thought that's in our future. And uh, I'm telling the story about the, about the origin of the book of Revelation. So the Apostle John writes it around this time period, roughly, I think, around 65 AD or so, or at least certainly around the time of the Neuronic Persecution. And of course, um, that isn't even much of a problem because, yeah, he did write it then. But the question is, but how does it apply? Does it apply to their world or does it apply to our world now? And my personal take is, is that most Everything of what John was writing in the book of Revelation actually had to do with um, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, coming, the coming kingdom of Christ and his ultimate coming in judgment upon Jerusalem and a vindication of the new covenant and the elimination ultimately of the old covenant symbols that, that were earthly in replacement for the new covenant heavenly symbols. And it's all wrapped up with that meaning. So that's kind of the big picture of what I'm, of what I'm doing in, in telling this story. Yep. Well, just to warn you, I am uh, Messianic Jewish and keep a lot of those old uh, traditions. We'll actually be celebrating Passover in just a few days. Um, and so I would, you and I are, are going to see a little bit differently on that. But one of the things I do want to touch on, because you emphasize this in your non-fictional take on it, you still do believe in a future uh, second coming, correct? Yes, I am what's called a partial preterist. Yes, and you just, are. Just to quickly define that, preterism is basically, it's a Latin word and it means in the past. And so basically it's the, it's the position that most, uh, or the, let's put it this way. When you say preterist, you're saying that prophecies have been fulfilled in the past. Now, mm -hmm. technically, all Christians are preterists to some degree because we believe the Messianic promises, for instance, were fulfilled in Christ in the past. Totally. Mm -hmm. um, but... To distinguish us from all the different viewpoints, uh, there there are there are those who who say everything has been fulfilled at that judgment coming of Christ, meaning the second coming, the resurrection, the ju final judgment, and they have a different interpretation. I'm more in the orthodox camp, which still believes that even though most of that stuff was fulfilled in a way that Christians aren't aware of, there is still yet a final return, physical return of Christ, a final resurrection of, uh, you know, physical resurrection and a final judgment. So that's the camp that I'm in. So in a way, you know, I'm still tied very much with the traditional Orthodox uh, notions and which is why a lot of uh, those who hold to the partial preterist view uh, do tend to be evangelicals and reformed people and, you know, who are, who are, who are not out they're, they're not outside the pale of Orthodoxy. Let's put it that way. 
Right. It, your, your position would be basically uh, the ominous position that the, the millennium is not meant to be a literal exactly 1,000 years. It's, it's simply using a you know round figure for a long time. But you still expect a new heavens, a new earth, and also it's some kind of major challenge uh, at the end of it. Would that be correct? Yeah, yeah. And and just, I mean, not like we want to get into deep th- – right. I don't know about your audience or not, but just so you understand, oh, yeah. I'm actually not an amill myself. I'm a post-mill preterist. Okay. So oh. just so you know, I, oh. I, don't, I don't – I think a lot of the allegorizing of a- a- amillennialism is, is – in that sense, I'm with the pre-mills in that I think there is a lot more specific references in the Book of Revelation, in the symbols, they're specifically referring to historical fulfillments, not general sort of like, oh, the church of the of Laodicea represents the age of the church where we're falling away or something. I don't I believe those are actual churches, the seven churches in ancient history that John was writing to. Yeah. Right. You know, our audience, by the way, is very highly sophisticated. Believe it or not, yep. as loud and wild as we are, we probably have the most theologically sophisticated audience out there. Rabbi Mike is a Messianic Jew. I am a Baptocostal Catholic. Once saved, always <laughs> saved. Um, I'm a seeker-friendly guy. So it's cool. a really interesting combination, but we've done a lot of Bible studies. We're one of the few uh, podcasts or live shows that does live Bible studies. We almost got all the way through the book of Judges. It took us about wow. a year and a half. We did Esther. and Yeah, we're pretty, pretty heavily theologically oriented. Um, where do you draw the line? Like New Jerusalem, do you see that um, still coming? Um, I, I consider the New Jerusalem when when Revel- not just Revelation, but I mean Hebrews talks about the New Jerusalem. Paul writes about the New Jerusalem in Galatians, right? So actually, the New Jerusalem, as I understand it, is clearly a symbol, uh, symbolic reference to the New Covenant, meaning um, uh, uh, the the New Jerusalem from above, the Jerusalem from heaven, is what comes down out of heaven. And in Revelation, it's described as this uh, literally absurd. Uh, you know, square that's fifteen th- or whatever, fifteen mile. What is it? hundred. It's about fifteen thousand mi- miles up in the sky or something. No, like, it's fifteen hundred like, miles. It's, uh, it's, yeah, yeah. Bases. It's, just, yeah exactly. it's absurdly obviously a symbol, but but my point is is so I believe that the 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 new. Uh, it, this goes back to a lot of of and a lot of my writing is based on this. And and you mentioned the other book. If people were to buy the Tyrant book, inside there you'll see um, like a little ad that you can, if you want to know more about the theology, I wrote, I released a another book called End Times Bible Prophecy, where I sort of explain my hermeneutic, as we call it. And so I'm very much of an Old Testament Christian. And I think in that way, Rabbi Mike, I think you and I will probably be have a kinship because um, I actually prefer the Old Testament because there's, <laughs> I, I love the art of the Old Testament, and I'm, I'm an artist, and I'll confess that. So when it talks about the new heavens and the new earth, um, it's primarily, essentially, like in Isaiah and such, it's clearly a, a symbolic reference to the covenant, basically. So um, the, the new heavens and the new earth, when, when God created his first covenant with Moses, talks about this in, in, in Psalms and in other places, um, he, it uses creation language. And it's like when God establishes his covenant, it's like he is creating the heavens and the earth out of the chaos. And that's a very Old Testament concept. And therefore, we're looking for a new covenant or a new heavens, a new earth. Um, and now, yeah, I believe it's possible that that, you know, that in the in the far distant future, when all of creation may be literally physically renewed and such. So there might be a physical fulfillment in the future. I don't know much about that myself, but just studying the notion of new heavens and new earth, um, I see it rooted in the Old Testament concept that had to do with uh, heavens and earth and creation language was deeply connected to covenants. So when God destroyed the first temple in 586 BC, he, in Jeremiah and such, he uses language where it's decreating the heavens and earth. It says it, it, like, he says that the earth returns to being wasteless, wasteful and void, right? And so it's like when, when God destroyed the old, the elements of the first covenant in, in 586 BC, it's like decreating everything. And then, um, and so therefore that's what happened in AD 70 when the temple and the city were destroyed. That was also a destruction of the heavens and the earth so to speak that's how the ancient jew would see it very interesting very interesting i you know myself i believe new jerusalem is an actual city coming down from space 
You're crazy! Yep, that's, that's my <laughs> view. Oh, I, oh, I, I, I'm supposed to be nice. Sorry. <laughs> no, the, reason, the reason I brought that up, Brian, is, is I wanted to give you a chance to get that out because you're right. This is an area where a lot of people have a lot of emotional investment in their view. And where a lot of people, you know, automatically takes anyone who takes a different view as being a heretic. I remember one time I was debating with a full printer, someone who thinks that somehow a thousand years got packed into, you know, 10 in, in 70, in the 60s and 70s uh, CE. Yeah. And uh, he was sitting there like begging for me to repent of my heresy, you know, <laughs> so I went to hell. And I was just like, dude, we're having an intellectual debate, okay? I and what know. Is, that, is that is that your view is, in fact, well within the pale of orthodoxy. Right. Uh, this, this is not something where anyone needs to look at Brian Godawa and say, well, no, I, I can't read his novels or anything else. It, it, no, Brian's an excellent writer. <laughs> you will enjoy his writings, especially if you, you know, have the Divine Council paradigm. And while there are areas where we would disagree, he's within the pale of biblical orthodoxy here. Um, so, yeah, and, and, and that's know, mostly where I went to go ahead and get that out the front of the interview here. You Thank know, you very heresy. much, because that's actually important. You're right, because where I personally stand on the full preterism, I know that there are, I know that, you know, I'm actually friends with some, with like Ken Gentry and Gary DeMar and some, some of the partial preterist go- scholars actually do consider full preterists to be heretical. I don't, I, I do think it's, there's a lot of danger to it, but I'm just really wary of, of saying that. Um, and yet on the other hand, look, 30 years ago when I was a, a dispensationalist and I first heard this, some of this notion that, hey, when Jesus uh, gave his uh, description on in Matthew 24 about the destruction of the temple and about his coming, that was actually fulfilled in the first century. I literally did think that was heresy, and I called it heresy. And so now I'm going to be very circumspect before I ever take that take that jump. But I've been called a heretic even recently by people, and it's just really sad to me because it shows the the lack of the ignorance of Christians have where they only study their one viewpoint and they don't realize that there are these other viewpoints and they're still within orthodoxy. And, but the problem is, is, uh, preterism has always been a minority viewpoint and, and I'll admit that right up front. And it still is obviously, but it is a growing, uh, especially in scholarly circles, it is a grow. It's, it's, it's becoming much more popular. And one of the reasons why is because, a lot of the dominant view, which is the dispensational view, that's the Hal Lindsey left behind type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot that is the predictions of those guys have been wrong over and over and over again. And while it's certainly possible that the man can be wrong, but the system can be right. What I'm saying is historically, what you see is with so many failures, people are starting to rethink their paradigms and say, well, maybe, maybe it's not just the guys who are going a little bit off the boat. Maybe I need to reevaluate the, the paradigm, the system itself. And, and that's why I suggest the further we get away from that 1948 year that was supposed to be the year for, you know, at least the Hal Lindsey viewpoint, you know, that was the turning point of all history. The further and further we get away of multiple generations from that, the less able they are to point to that as some kind of fulfillment in their whole system. And so more people are starting to consider these other viewpoints. And, and that's just an, I mean, I think that's, that's factual regardless of what we believe, uh, because that's what I've been seeing occurring in, in the theological landscape as it is. You know, actual heresy, actual heresy is something that you pointed out in your new book, Tyrant. And uh, that is that um, when you talk about St. John saying that many many antichrists have gone out into the world, these people were, um, you know, they were like um, docetists and uh, Gnostics preaching that Jesus did not actually come in the flesh. Now, that's actual heresy. Anything yes, else, yes. you know, beyond the pale. I thought that was important that you, you, you started that out right in the beginning as kind of a foundation in your book. You know, I thought it was really important. You know, it's, it sends a really strong message. That's a good theological, you know, meat and potatoes right there. Yeah. And to be, to be honest, you know, this first book, um, there, while it, while it's certainly in current, one of the reasons why I, I'm writing, um, theological novels is I had a very much of a similar experience to C.S. Lewis and I'm not equating myself with him. I'm just saying, uh, it seems like every time I, I have a, 
uh, an epiphany in my, in my life, spiritually or theologically, I often find out that C.S. Lewis, and I write about it, I find out C.S. Lewis already had it, and he wrote about it better. And, um, <laughs> you know, so anyway, he had this point in his life where, you know, he was so obsessed with the rational apologetics, as I have been in my life. And uh, he had this uh, this debate with a, uh, uh, Anscombe, you know, who's a Catholic scholar, and she demolished some of his arguments for the existence of existence of God. And the point of it wasn't that she she was an atheist; she was a Christian. She was just saying those are bad arguments. But mm -hmm. it shook him up so much that it made him start to realize that this dichotomy within our Christian lives and within the church, at, quite frankly, between reason and imagination. You know, we think that reason is clear and distinct ideas, but imagination and creativity—that's vague and dangerous, right? You know, so you gotta you gotta be careful of poetry and 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 create creation, creativity, and stuff. But the thing is, is he realized the limits of reason. It's not that the, it's not that it, we need reason, but it's it can't communicate or embody the truth in in many ways that imagination can. And that was around the time period we started to focus on his fiction and he started to embody his using the power of narrative to embody the viewpoint so that you don't have to agree with his viewpoint. You can like, right. I mean, like uh, Chronicles of Narnia are famous even in the secular world because, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's kind of the, <laughs> The experience I had where I'm like, you know what, I definitely have a viewpoint and it's embodied in this. But this first novel, um, I actually had my editor told me, she's like, you know, I'm not sure you're really clear enough about your view. And I thought, no, it's OK. I mean, I'll be explaining things as the as the as the series goes on. But I want people to experience what I'm communicate, what I've what I've discovered in, in this ancient research. And and so whether or not, no matter what you believe, and even if you don't know, even if you don't know what this viewpoint is, you're going to learn a lot of great theological, spiritual things, and historical things, and hopefully I think you'll experience it in a way that might be more powerful or meaningful than, than all the, you know, than, than the theological books, you know, of course I, I, I do both. So that's, you know, that's my goal is I do, I do both, but that's, that's sort of my philosophical foundation of, of, of why I tell stories and why I think storytelling is so powerful. I mean, that's what made left behind so powerful. You know, yeah. I, I mean, you know, left behind is, is not necessarily a well, well-written story, but it, it embodied <laughs> that worldview in a very entertaining way. And, and people loved it, you know? So, so uh, I think there's a lot of value to that. And no one's really done what I've done. One guy has done it 10 years ago that I know of, uh, Hank Hanegraaff did, but uh, no one has done where they've incorporated the divine council worldview, particularly with this sort of what we call the preterist understanding of revelation. So I'm excited about being unique and people are, it's going to blow people away, but they'll be entertained, but they'll also, hopefully it won't be the shocking thing about like, you know, like if you read a theological, you know, book and you just say, ah, you know, throw it away. This one, at least you can adjust it through the story, if that makes sense. No, that makes perfect sense. Actually, I was um, at the library with my kids the other day, and while they were uh, playing on the tablets, I found out that they had a copy of the multi-volume uh, interpreter's commentary on the Bible. And I you know, flipped <laughs> open, and I started reading uh, and just some of the stuff they had on Revelation, because I'm working on a project of my own, uh, which is actually very similar to yours, although it takes a different stance on some of these things. Uh, it's very much a get back to basics and get rid of some the cruft thing. But one of the things that struck me is it cautioned against, um, it, you know, it acknowledged that, there, that Revelation has all these allusions to the Old Testament, but it cautions against treating it simply as a uh, game of find the reference. Because yes. when you do that, you lose the imagery, you lose the imagination, you lose the power in that particular genre and you end up missing out on everything because you're too, you're missing the forest for the trees basically. So yeah, I, it, think, I think that's an excellent point because, um, and, and some of the premier revelation scholars like, uh, Beale and others make the point that, uh, the apostle John would, he's a, he's not just a anointed of God. He's a creative genius too, because he actually in his draw, it is one of the most, it's one of, it's of the new Testament books. It's one of the ones that, uh, alludes to or refers to the Old Testament more than any, but a lot of it is he'll draw from, like, for instance, he the most, probably one of the books he draws most heavily from is it the book of Ezekiel. And he draws a lot of the imagery and even a lot of the, um, the you, can, you, you can see the structure of Ezekiel in the book of Revelation. However, the point that these, 
the 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 premier scholars all make is he but he he takes he he uses the a lot of the imagery loosely and he redefines it and recrafts it for his own purposes so you're right we've got to be diligent in in you know finding where it's kind of you know trying to see well how does the ancient hebrew understand the, these images not our modern day Amer western american but then we also have to say but he's not just just copying it wrote he's he's using it and recrafting it for his own purposes and i agree with you on that i think that that makes it that's what makes revelation such an amazing exciting study you know in fact i would say you know in in writing this this series i, I i've had to dive i've always avoided revelation i think most most christians that I know do because <laughs> it's <laughs> it's just too it's too opaque and messy, you know and and uh, I'm weird. Scary. I'm part of the revelation it's... and uh, okay. and always coming back to it. But yes, oh, fair enough. But I've it. avoided it. But we're not. But by having to study it for this this novel series, it has it has blown me away and opened my spiritual life. In look, not and I'm trying to what I'm trying to say is it's not like. Oh, I've studied the Bible, so now I know what all these reference mean, and I know this is what the Antichrist is and the beast and all this. It's no, it's more than that. It's you you start to plumb the depths of God because when you when you when you when you um delve into and when you saturate yourself in these images, whether it's the you know the the locust or the what is a beast in 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 scripture and all this kind of stuff, uh, but also you know the throne of God and the trumpets and all this stuff when you're when you're studying that in depth. It's like you're being, you're, it's like God is sh opening up his own self to you through this poetic imagery, through the meaning and through all this stuff. And it's, it's like you're, you're coming before the throne of God spiritually as you're, as you're studying this. So mm -hmm. I would say that, that, um, you know, uh, Christians are missing out by not trying to understand the book of Revelation. I respect those who say, look, the, you know, there's a lot of kooks who who've just obsessed with this stuff and they've made all these kooky speculations and they're always wrong. And then you got, so like, why, why bother? You know, because what's matter, what, what's important is getting people saved, the gospel, living the Christian life, whatever. I respect their intent, but I've now, cause I used to be that way, but now I'm, I'm like, yeah, but, in reality, though, if you neglect any aspect of God's full word, you're actually you're actually um, neglecting in your own spiritual life. You you are going to be uh, how can I say? Uh, you're going to be lacking in in the fullness of what God wants for you. Yeah, you're so ripping I, yourself off. Yeah, yeah. So yes, it's hard. Yes. Uh, there, there are as many viewpoints on Revelation as there are uh, uh, interpreters sometimes, but the very process itself, uh, I think, blesses you like this, like the the letter says it will. You know, yeah, and there is a, a promise that's there. A beautiful thing. It's There's beautiful. a promise of a blessing right at the very beginning yeah. of the book. Yeah. I think you know a lot of people think it's you know a lot of people shy away from uh, Revelation because it's scary, you know, and a lot of times a lot of people that read it think when God is getting really angry, um, they think that it's aimed at them. And yeah. if you have to understand, like, especially with your um, broad ranging, deep spiritual, you know, uh, sons of God worldview, I mean, the, the bad guys in Revelation, they're not you. They're not you, you know, in the tavern. They are seriously evil dudes that really hate God, that want yeah. to go to war with him. I think that's important to understand. I know for what absolutely, and I think in, in that sense, uh, we can all you know, uh, um, no matter what, no matter what you think the reference are in the Book of Revelation, and this is where you know I do agree. You know, the, we as Christians, we we must seek to try to find as much common ground as we can to unite in Christ, and and I certainly would, I would, I would say that that. Um, that we can all draw an application from Scripture, regardless of our viewpoint, that A, God is greater than the world, the kingdom of God is greater than the kingdoms of, kingdom, kingdoms of man, Jesus reigns over all from his heavenly throne, you know, and we serve that creator God, and in the end, we win. You know, all that kind of stuff we can all agree on and, and have this basically, you know, sort of a, a victorious, glorious view of the spiritual truth of God's kingdom and the new covenant and 
and the Messiah and what it all means. And I think that there's a there's that that wrapping up nature of that revelation gives you that that beauty. And I, I like to use the word beauty a lot because I'm an artist, yes. And I think that beauty is this one aspect that a lot of Christians miss. Um, uh, they think that it's just sort of, it's a non-essential, yeah, beauty is good, and oh, you know, yeah, beauty can go if I God, but I actually, you know, and I've written books on this even, about how uh, beauty is a part of, of how God reveals truth, and so as you study the beautiful nature of the language and the meanings of the symbols and the all that kind of stuff, that's the beauty I'm talking about. It's this unfolding or a right apocalypse, the unveiling uh, of Christ and the beauty of God's word. That's I'm, I think I'm starting to wax too philosophical here. Stop <laughs> no, me. Okay. Stop me before I kill myself. That's what we no, do it's here. Fine. And, and, and actually, some of what you're saying remind me. Uh, many uh, years ago, I had the uh, pleasure of uh, doing an internship at Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. And I got to meet a lot of really famous uh, Christian apologists, including uh, Paul Copen. And uh, I was really young, just getting the revelation at the time, wouldn't shut up about it, all that. And, you know, Paul said something, I'm sure he was just trying to deflect an argument, but he said something that I thought was kind of profound. He, he said, look, Michael, I think that in the end, we're going to find that all the views on revelations, the preterist view, the historicist view, and the futurist view, will all have turned out to be correct, because none of them fit, in, you know, the whole yeah. thing in, in perfectly. Yeah. And uh, the, Oh, the, yeah, absolutely. I fully agree with you. And, and I would say, even now— with my current viewpoint, I've been through them all, but and they all have holes, and mine does too. And there are anomalies I can't answer, or that make me go, "Ooh, well, I'm not sure about that one. I, I don't understand. Yeah, that 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 that's a problem." So if you're honest, uh, I think that's where that's where we can find humility is by being honest with our own. Uh, the the our, the faults in our own system and and facing them and acknowledging them and that frees us to be able to have the kind of conversations where we're not judging uh, judging one another in a in a in a negative way. Right. So let, let, let's um, you know Revelation's fun and, and we can hang out in Revelation for a while. I think it, one of the things I found kind of fascinating is you know as you dig into Revelation, the more you find that John apparently actually went to Babylon at some point because he there was a numerous references to Babylonian symbols there, including the whole thing of one of the seven heads of the beast being wounded is straight out of a, um, uh, a glyph we've got of I think Marduk uh, severing one of the heads of Lotan. Oh no, pagan oh. themes in the Bible. Oh. My. Heretic. Yeah, but if, That's another thing. So we, if we want to go just explore those, those are fine. But let's, yeah. let's back up a little bit because um, uh, like you, uh, you know, because Revelation is poetic, because it's so sweeping and so forth, um, I think that you have to go back and really tackle um, something that is written not in vast sweeping uh, apocalyptic language, but is uh, more written in teaching prose. And you spend a lot of time uh, in your book really focusing on um, uh, the Olivet Discourse. That's Matthew 24, 25, Mark 13, and arguably Luke 21, although Luke 21 is a weird outlier. <laughs> um, so, it, you know, a lot of people don't realize that there's, e that there's even a point to the Preterist perspective on those passages. So why don't you just sort of give us like the broad overview sure. of why you see those as having been completely fulfilled in uh, 70 CE. Well, I think for me and, and for a lot of us, um, the, the, the entry point become that, that, that starts to um, sort of gnaw like a stone in the shoe uh, of the other viewpoints that that ult ultimately ends up opening the door towards my viewpoint is um, when you're when you're approaching uh, a biblical text you know we we have this you know we we have to draw from many different sources etc but I think most Christians do believe that uh, the primary or the ultimate authority is scripture and so let scripture interpret scripture is sort of one of the priorities when you're talking about interpretation and so if there's something you know, in the scripture that, that guides you in the interpretation, then that should take precedent over what you think is clear in another, in, in another uh, case. So for example, uh, yeah, when I, when, when you read as a modern Westerner, you read Matthew 24, you read this stuff and it sounds from within our context that, oh, these are all futuristic things. Um, and, uh, and, and they haven't happened yet, whether it's the abomination of desolation or Christ coming on the clouds or what have, what have you. Um, and it just seems, it seems obvious to us. But then when you, when you look closer and the thing that started me 
me down my this new path was that that sermon in Matthew 24 is bookended by uh, a statement w where Jesus uh, talks about um, in, in in Matthew 23 he's talking about the you know the Jewish leaders and and how they've reject they're they're going to be rejecting Messiah and they're going to kill him just like they killed all the other prophets and God's going to judge you he's going to take away your house and he basically says he Jesus prophesies you know I I, not one, one, not one stone of this temple will be left. Uh, you know, it's all going to be overthrown because you did not recognize, um, you know, your visitation because you, you, you're going to reject Messiah, and and then he says, and all these things will happen to this generation, and he says that at the end of the discourse as well. He repeats himself, and all these things shall occur in this generation. So it starts me down this pathway of well. Should I interpret everything with between those bookends as occurring within that generation? It sure seems like I should. Um, and and that means if I think uh, maybe what I think it means, the abomination of desolation means, I have to temper that by Jesus's own hermeneutic principle. So um, and when you look when where Jesus talks about this generation, when he uses that phrase or that concept all throughout the Gospels, in fact, all throughout the New Testament, but nevertheless, all everywhere Jesus talks about this generation, he uses that phrase a lot. It's always in relation to judgment, actually. And it's, you know, I tell you, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah will be better than this generation when it stands up in judgment and all this. And so he's basically saying to throughout the Gospels, he's pointing to the Jews who are around him, who are going to reject him as Messiah. And he tells them about the parable of, of the, the vineyard and the tenants, you know, who, who, who killed the prophets and then killed God's son. And God will come back and destroy his city and, and, and you know, give his vineyard to another nation producing the fruit of it. These are all this judgment upon though this generation who's rejecting Messiah. And so to me, that's the hermeneutical sort of, I don't know, guidepost or, or, uh, uh, scriptural uh, uh, foundation that will help me to go, okay, if I'm going to figure out what these things mean, I've got to interpret it within that context. So they have to have all happened within the generation that Jesus was speaking to. You know, a generation is roughly 40 years or so or whatever. And um, so that's that's the big picture that makes me start to reevaluate. Maybe they aren't all in my future, but maybe they occurred within his generation. And uh, that's the that's the big picture. Thing. And then you start looking at each of the details, and lo and behold, sure enough, uh, you know you can find the fulfillment of all those passages in history, um, and ultimately leading up to the destruction of the temple, just like Jesus said. You know, in the beginning of Matthew 24, Jesus says the the heart and soul of the the Olivet discourse is is if I can get to it here, Matthew 24 is that phrase where you know. Um, Jesus leaves the temple. He says, truly, I say to you, uh, not one stone will be left upon another. And then he's on the Mount of Olives. And um, they ask him, uh, OK, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming into the end of the age? And so that's what all this stuff is all about. The sign of the, his coming, the end of the age. And, and what are these things? Well, then he lists out those things. And so the, the, the perennial question has always been, are these Different things, the sign of his coming and the end of the age, are they separate, are they different, or are they one package deal? And I understand them to be a package deal, and that's why the destruction of the temple in AD 70, of which most Bible scholars will admit that's what he's referring to when he says that, um, that's not separate from his coming and the end of the age. Those are all part of one package, and that's that's my view of entering into Matthew 24, you know? Okay. If that's so, a starting point. You know, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. A lot of sense. Wait a minute. Okay. You know what's really interesting about that? Um, when Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, not one stone shall be left upon another. I mean, you look at the Roman ruins and all these ancient... And you know, there's a few stones that are stacked, right? I mean, there's... There's ruins way older than the temple, and they're still like partially, you know, put together. But um, what happened um, when the temple burned? There was so much gold inside. You know, the the walls were just lined with gold. And what happened when it burned? The gold dripped down in between all the stones. And after it was done, all these scavenger dudes, miner, basically gold miners, went through with crowbars and stuff, and they pried every single stone de mm -hmm. apart and dug into the cracks and got all the gold out so that yeah, i've actually walked below the wall where the and 
walked among the stones, they tossed over the side as they were doing it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. They, really massive stone block. So that so. prophecy, he literally, that was literally fulfilled. There was not one stone left upon another. You know, if I could say at this moment, just to point out something that is fascinating, and you guys know about this, um, there, this, this event that occurred with the destruction of Jerusalem, basically the armies of Rome led by, uh, at first, um, yeah, uh, led by Vespasian and then ultimately f- com- completed through Titus, uh, where it was called the Wars of the Jews. And there is one, one sh- massively detailed description of everything that went on and was written by a famous ancient Jewish historian named Josephus, and it was called right. the War of the Jews. And so... Um, if I, I highly recommend it's 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 a dry book, unfortunately. But if you can find like a modern translation, I would recommend Christians pick it up and read it because it's just fascinating anyway. And I use that book as a major source for telling my story as well because I I you know even though you know Josephus well, again Josephus was an eyewitness and had access to all the immediate eyewitnesses. Right? Yes, in fact, he was in the battle on the side of the Jews, and then he ended up going over to the side of the Russian, uh, Russians. <laughs> <laughs> See, now you're, you're in our dispensationalist. Um, yeah. he went the over, last Trump. <laughs> now we're into the last Trump he went podcast. Over to Rosh. He went over to Rosh. <laughs> Donald and the aliens. Come on. Yeah. No, so he goes over to the Romans. So he was in both sides. So he, the details he gives is just fascinating from the inside. So, yeah, you're right. He went through it all. Now, he, he was very political, though, because he ended up becoming – he changed his name to Flavius Josephus, which was the same name as the Romans who conquered the Jews. And he, this, this book has a lot of political sides to it. But nevertheless, there's a, still there's a fairness that we can find the facts that kind of did happen in there. And it's just – um, and so that's what I use, and so and that's where a lot of you, yeah. where you guys got a lot of the the references you're you're referring to as well. Exactly, and, and so people understand Josephus, his specific goal when he's writing these things, a he's trying to let Jews outside uh, who weren't there know what happened and how bad things got on the Jewish side that provoked the Romans into this fight. He was trying to uh, he was making a point of emphasizing that the uh, Romans were only uh, going against the zealots who captured the city. They actually wanted the uh, temple intact if they could have had it um and the and so he he's actually uh about as fair to all sides as someone could expect him to be you know yeah except maybe to the zealots he didn't like them very much for very obvious reasons um so he is actually prime uh material and and his book is of course it's been in public domain forever and uh, it's easy to pick up cheap. You can see, find it online for free, which makes it searchable, of course. Uh, it is something that you need to read if you want to understand what was going on right at the end of the apostolic era. But I do warn uh, you, it is very dry and boring because he just – there's a lot of hyper detail that, that – yeah. so I would recommend if people are interested – really, I mean there's a book called um, – Josephus, The Essential Works by Paul Mayer, M-A-I-E-R, and he basically simplifies it, cuts it down to the the most important stuff, and sort of retells the story using Josephus, so it's more readable for the modern-day reader. And I would actually recommend something like that because, like I said, I'll tell you, I could never – I could never get through. So I could never get through Josephus until I needed to for the sake of my research. Then I was able to do it. <laughs> okay. Now this though is where it's like as you go through and you're looking <clears throat> at Josephus and so forth, and you go looking at uh, you know the the birth pangs, if you will. Okay. False Christ and false messiahs. Eh, you can make the case that, that the zealots fell into that, and certainly there were a lot of them running around at the time. Uh, wars and rumors, wars. Yes, definitely. Famines. Yes, definitely. Earthquakes. Yes, it turns out there were some. Uh, so all of that fits. Um, if you're interpreting the second coming as being the actual fall of Jerusalem, that fits. For me, the weak spot, and this is where when I quiz you on to give you a chance to uh, explain your view on it, is in trying to identify the abomination of desolation um, in this event. Mm-hmm. Um, if it, because it's a very specific reference, and Brian, why don't, it, you of course know the arguments against it because you grew up with them. Why don't you go ahead and you know present that and present the, the view you're taking on it? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'm not like uh, that's that's an area that's really complex, and I Daniel. Um, uh, how can I put it? Um, I'm not as studied on that issue. So, you know, okay. I do have a viewpoint on it, but just beware that that's one of the least uh, 
probably one of the weaknesses of my own study. Um, however, uh, the basic principle that I'm following is again, let scripture interpret scripture first. And when you come to a, the text, uh, oh gosh, there's a few things about those other, maybe after, there's a few things about the wars and rumors of wars that I wanted to point out that were really actually fascinating. Okay, but back we, up. We, if you, do you mind? No, not at all. Oh, Go. okay. I'll just point we're out a couple things. Promote. It's all good. <laughs> okay, what, one of the problems I've always had with every viewpoint I've had is, you know, sometimes those statements by Christ just seem like, oh, come on, these aren't prophecies. These are always happening. There are always <laughs> false Christ, right? There are always wars and rumors of war. There's always famines and earthquakes. Come on, you know? And I've always had problems with that. And, and in a sense, that's true. But what's interesting is there is one specific time period that, that these prophecies, I think, make sense within their own context. And, and let me let me explain quickly. I'll just rattle it off. False Christ, you know, oh, there will be false Christ. And, and they're going to tell you they're in the wilderness, but don't, you know, don't go there because I tell you, you know, as the lightning comes across the sky, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, what's it, one of the interesting things that strikes me is, well, yeah, there's always false Christ, but in that time period, that was very, very relevant about Christ's in the wilderness because like in now nowadays, it's like, you know, these survivalist groups are nuts. They don't do anything. You know, you're going to have more power in the city than in the, in the, in the, in, in the rural areas. Right. But at that time period, that would be very relevant because there were a lot of false Christ in the wilderness. A lot of them were rising up against Rome because the Jews were expect the Jews who rejected Jesus Messiah still believed in Daniel's prophecy of the Messiah coming. So they thought Messiah was going to be coming. Some of them even pretended to be Messiah or thought that they might be the Messiah and they were rising up with these different bands, not just the zealots, but other bandits and stuff. Mm. And they were all in the wilderness. And Josephus um, actually uh, explained some of these guys and he literally says, and they went to the wilderness and said, follow us into the wilderness. And so in that time period, that's very relevant more so than I would say even today. Wars and rumors of wars, another classic example. Aren't there always wars and rumors of wars? Well, yeah, always, always. But in that particular time period, that claim would make more relevance, in my opinion, than any other time period because they were in what was called Pax Romana. Pax right. Romana was the the basic belief, or not belief, but the basic notion of the Empire of Rome had so conquered that known world that they had stopped the wars, you know, because everyone was under the power of Rome. And if you rose up, you'd be crushed. So there was relative, you know, of course, relative calm and peace. But because of the, uh, right around that time of the Jewish revolt, that caused a lot of other wars and rumors of wars. So in that time period of Pax Romana, wars and rumors of wars would actually be unique. And then mm -hmm. lastly, just to just to throw it out with, um, uh, let's see, persecution. Well, the other stuff is just, um, you know, Jesus is talking to the disciples and he's saying they're going to bring you before uh, governors and, and, and leaders and don't worry, don't just trust me and the Holy Spirit. Well, that all happened. We know that in the book of Acts. So, so those are those are the couple of things that I thought were just kind of like that stand out in that first century time period that I don't think would apply to any. Yeah, maybe maybe you can make them apply to other time periods, but you can see how they're uniquely tied to his generation or his audience. That's all. Particularly I want to say. with the focus when his focus is on the destruction of the temple. It yes. makes sense that the wars and rumors wars are going to be not like, you know, watching on CNN the year, uh, all the way around. It's something that's yes. immediately impacting what he's talking about there. Yes, yes. Because they're all thinking, hey, we're the peace, peace and safety. We're under the peace of Rome. You know, there's we're, there's no problem. But then all of a sudden, all these wars did explode in that time period. And Tacitus and other historians talk about that as well. So it's, yeah, it's fascinating. But anyway, we can jump into <laughs> right the now, the whole just, audience is like, what side is Michael on? <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> Okay, well, we should probably clear that up. I mean, we don't want our audience to think that we have the same eschatology. So, I mean, uh, we uh, Brian, have you ever heard of uh, isochronal eschatology? No. That is the idea that um, uh, everything repeats in cycles and patterns. And, uh, uh, you know, there, there's 
double, there's dual fulfillment, triple fulfillment, quadruple fulfillment, and it you know it just keeps on repeating in these cycles. There's this yeah. constant theme that just keeps repeating, and you know um, the Lord says you know in the Old Testament that you know the Lord chases after what has been. So you know we see we agree with you on these things, but we also gotcha. see it we also see it repeating in a cycle yeah. applying to these end times. Okay. Just to illustrate, that's why, for example, the apostles could sometimes refer to prophecies that people would have taken as already been fulfilled and say, but this is how it's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And, the, and you know, I think that establishes that pattern there. And, the, and, the, and that's one of the reasons why I can totally agree with everything you're saying. Gotcha. Um, I, but the I still expect, especially since there are those little niggling details that, you know, just it, you can it fits. And yet you have just a couple of square pegs i think that and round holes and therefore i think god has deliberately made a couple of things not fit uh to okay. do it however unless you understand the preterist view you can't understand how this may or may not repeat and that's one of the reasons i'm i'm having fun and uh you know more or less uh promoting your view here um gotcha. and uh uh, getting getting that out there because it is an area that you know people draw judgments without ever having read the other side. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that there were actually signs in the sky at the time of the fall of Jerusalem. You know th- things yeah. like that. They they have no idea that that was recorded by Josephus and later by Tacitus and so forth. Yeah. Um, Every so good futurist is a preterist too. <laughs> is it, well, <laughs> what? I didn't hear what every good futurist is a good preterist. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, we s- um, let's see here. Uh, so you want to get to abomination of desolation then? Yeah. Just like I said, um, to me, the, the fact that it's like, yes, you can make it sort of fit, but only by saying, and by, um, you end up having to go to Luke and, and Luke, I find his, he departs on some major, uh, trains of thought, from the other two, which is really intriguing because Luke, of course, is basically, you know, uh, writing for Paul for all intents and purposes. And yet, and then when you look at what Luke writes about the abomination of desolation, where he seems to equate it with the army surrounding Jerusalem, but then Paul writes about in second Thessalonians and says, it will be a man standing in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. It it ends up, you end up going, okay, what is, where's Paul going with this? (laughs) So, now, are you talking about Thessalonians? Uh, we yes. talked about the man of sin. Yeah, uh, first okay. and second Thessalonians. I'm utterly convinced that uh, because Paul starts off First Thessalonians four by uh, uh, that whole rapture passage, which is not about pre-trib rapture. I'm sorry, Derek Gilbert. You know, uh, uh, to ruin your party. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, it, it's not pre-trib rapture. It is. You can sit there and just line it up. You know. You know, uh, point for point, and he's very obviously commenting on Yeshua's second coming as described in the Olivet Discourse, and he even prefaces it by saying, we know by the Lord's own word. That means he's quoting something Yeshua taught every time he uses that phrase. And then in Second Thessalonians, he's going back, all right, wait, wait, obviously there's some confusion here, okay? This won't happen until this happens, and he goes back, and, I'm, and uh, he's commenting on the Olivet Discourse again. So I think, you know, when we're talking about comparing Scripture to Scripture— Yep. Yes, we need to compare Matthew to Luke. We also need to compare Matthew to uh, and Luke to First and Second Thessalonians because I think there's a deeper thing going on here in how how those passages deal with it. Uh-huh. Yeah, and I I certainly agree that they're linked. I, I don't know that they're that the man of lawlessness is a synonym for the abomination of desolation, but um, I definitely agree that they're linked. Okay. Uh, so so what you were referring to is you know in case the audience is not as familiar in Luke 21. Uh, Jesus is um, giving a very similar sermon. Some people say, oh, it's a different sermon. That's okay if, if, it's a, if it's not the same as the Olivet Discourse. It doesn't matter because itinerant preachers would give the same sermon over and over again multiple exactly. times. And we also know that Luke, here's, so here's how I'm coming at it. So Luke mm-hmm. is writing, you know, when you read Matthew, I love, Matthew's my favorite gospel because it's so Jewish. Hey, me too. Yeah, <laughs> totally. So that, but that's why you've got a lot more, uh, uh, you know, Old Testament testament references and such luke is writing more for greeks and people who who wouldn't understand you know necessarily right up front jewish phrases like the abomination of desolation so when you in luke 21 20 he says he uses he's talking about the same basic again it doesn't have to be the olivet discourse in my mind it's just the same sermon and he's making the same he's talking about the same things but you know luke is giving us some other 
the Gospels are not exactly, uh, I got news for Christians, it's God didn't dictate the words to them. Uh, they were written by, uh, with the, the, you know, with the authority of God's spirit, but nevertheless, through human men who, who added their own perspective at times, and it clears up some things. And so when Jesus talks about when you see the abomination of desolation um, uh, and then flee to the Judea in Matthew 24, in Luke 21, that same phrase is said this way, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So just from a basic perspective, I come at it going, oh, Okay, so if I want to if I want to figure out what abomination desolation means, because back in Daniel it can get quite complex. There's two of them. Some people believe there's three, yada yada. But certainly Jesus is interpreting it, or at least Luke is is like helping us Greeks to understand that Jewish concept by mm-hmm. basically telling us that notion of the abomination of desolation um, is. Is, is a reference to Jerusalem being surrounded by armies. Now, there's the other part of the verse, you know, in um, Matthew 24, where it says, I want to get it right. So, um, uh, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Many, you know, you read this again, this, or this is a problem with translations. And, and this is why we have to, you know, uh, study to show ourselves approved and allow the teachers in the body of Christ to, to, to teach us because there are textual problems that we aren't aware of when we're just reading one English translation. And this phrase, the holy place in this particular translation, we automatically assume, well, that means the, the holy place is the temple. Not necessarily, actually not so. Uh, that phrase does not necessarily mean the holy place of the temple. And, and, and the way that we can see that is in Mark, where Jesus is giving that same sermon, again, we read him in Mark 13, 14, he says, but when you see the abomination of desolation, standing where he ought not to be. So there's a there's a fullness of the picture here that's saying, okay, you know, I, I come at that saying, so basically the abomination of desolation is Titus and his Roman armies are unholy, you know, pagan idolaters. <laughs> and and they are coming into the Holy Land, the place where they should not be, you know? So number one, just entering the Holy Land is enough to fulfill that. But you could also say, well, but but Luke is saying he's surrounded by armies. Well, Titus surrounded Jerusalem with his armies. So that the very fact that the Roman armies were surrounding the holy place of God and his temple, right? That is where he not ought be. And that's a holy place as far as God's concerned. It's not the, it's not the temple proper. It's just... That that's what it is. That's a holy place where the pagan armies should not be. So that's the picture that I see of what, again, uh, in that time period, uh, if I'm balancing the other scriptures to be consistent with each other, that's how I'm seeing it. The problem with that is that the abomination, when it's spoke of that way, is always an idol. It's always a statue. It's always an idol. So you got that. That's a really tough one to deal with. That's kind of standing in your way. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, and that's sort of where I'm looking at it too. Because it, it, you know, Josephus tells us that the abomination of desolation was when, and this is from uh, History of the Jews, not Wars of the Jews, uh, for, for the audience's sake. I know you know it already. Um, it, the, it, that it, he refers to that as the actual act of putting up a an idol of Zeus in the holy of holies. So does first and second Maccabees. So to Matthew uh, writing to a uh, Jewish audience, to the and to them, it, you know, it, it, as a matter of fact, Daniel chapter eleven says first the they surround the um, uh, Jerusalem uh, with the armies and then that they would set up the abomination of desolation in in the holy place and so the uh, it, so to me it's I think it's a little bit of a stretch to say that it's just the army surrounding Jerusalem uh-huh. um, it, it, and that's and I'll leave it at that because the, the point isn't to just go at and go at or anything like that but it, no, no it, that's fine no that, that's totally fair I, I that's that's totally good I, I hear you now it's interesting I can't I can't find it right now i'm looking i'm looking for i just i just copied and pasted this down earlier but you'll have to trust me on this as a matter of fact uh josephus in antiquities actually Mm -hmm. claims that when he's talking about the abomination in the antiquities he also says that that's when rome that the abomination was when rome um came against jerusalem so he actually himself 
makes a reference that Titus and the Roman armies were the abomination of desolation, as he interpreted I've heard that before. I've not found the passage. Is that I, oh, a particular I'll, translation? Because I actually went looking, as I was prepping for this, I actually went looking for all the references to abomination uh, in Josephus, because I remembered someone once claiming that Josephus called the uh, zealots in the temple an abomination, and therefore that's the fulfillment of it. Yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, it, it's, that's where I'm, I just wasn't able to find it in the translations that I was searching online. Yeah, well, you know... Um, I can't find it this moment. Right now, that's cool. I mean, I'll, I'll get it to you though. But oh, actually, I think. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I'm writing my own book, so I, I'm always happy to have someone else do my research for me. <laughs> yeah, really. Send me an email, or give me your email, so that I, I'll see. Because I just found it the other day, and I don't know why it's not. I'm looking where I thought I pasted it. I'm like, where is it? Ah. Happens but, to me every time I'm doing yes. an interview on something where, or a debate. I, you know, of course, it's not going to turn up when you go looking for it. Because I, I mean, it it actually shocked me because I'm going. Whoa, I didn't know he said that. And he said it in the generic sense of Daniel talked about this abomination and that was the Roman armies when they came. And I, I'm thinking like, wait a minute, why would Josephus say this? Because he's, you know, he's kissing Titus's ass normally. And mm -hmm. like, he's trying to make Titus look good. And then, but, but he says it in a way where it's not as, it's not as bold as like, uh, you know, like saying he was the abomination, but he's talking right. about the abomination. And then he says, oh, and then this was also fulfilled in Rome when it came against the, the city. And then he kept going on. And I'm like, Josephus likes to, even though he's trying to, to make Rome look as good as possible, he gets in his little digs at times mm -hmm. where it's like, ooh, that's kind of cool. But nevertheless, uh, there are also um, in Wars 661, he does talk about how the Romans carry the ensigns into the temple. And so mm -hmm. in point of fact, um, Titus actually did bring the the um, uh, uh, the standards, the the Roman standards of the legion, which were idolatrous because they had the right. image of Caesar, and so those were brought in the temple. And uh, so technically, there was that fulfillment. I don't think I don't think that has to happen to be a fulfillment, from my perspective. Mm -hmm. But but nevertheless, it, it just so happens that it did. Uh, in, in that sense. Uh, Rabbi yeah, Mike, I, I don't know if you'd agree with me. I think you would. Um, the abomination would be an idol, and desolation is not destruction. It's um, God desolating the temple, leaving the temple, his spirit leaving the temple. That's the, that's the common futurist interpretation anyway. Are we agreeing on that? I can't. Not exactly, because the, the Spirit of God had left the temple at the time of the first temple being destroyed. Uh, the second yeah. time, the uh, when you've got the abomination of Antiochus, it's very clearly in the Holy of Holies. Um, and the interesting thing is when that happened, uh, you know, we got Hanukkah out of it. And we won. Yep. Um, and so there's an expectation that that would follow again. In the case of Titus, I think your original argument that uh, th that seeing the army surround Jerusalem would be considered a kind of abomination is probably the better one, simply because by the time Titus uh, was erecting ensigns in the temple courtyard, it's a little bit late to leave. You know, it's like <laughs> that, that warning doesn't help you might very much anymore. So, and, that, yeah. and that's whether the, and I've never understood anyone ever trying to claim that that was the fulfillment. It's like, well, yeah, sure, they're going to leave then. You know, it, it, yeah, it, yeah, exactly. No, that that's <laughs> I I totally agree. I totally agree. So, on that. And, and that and that's why I bring up the connection with Second uh, Thessalonians and Paul speaking of the man of sin standing in the temple, of God showing himself. He yep. is God, because if Paul intends for us to that, that's what he's interpreting the abomination of desolation, which given the historical allusion to Antiochus Epiphanes doing exactly that, then yeah, he, it, and it would make then you could sort of make that connect with what Titus did after the fact, but then the timing is all wrong, and that and that's where I'm and that's why I said at the outset I think you're right. I think I think there's an extra piece of the puzzle here, and so the uh, and that requires us to go a little deeper and perhaps see that there could be a, a future fulfillment as well. Yeah, so. my my interpretation of the abomination of desolation to come would be the same as Antioch Epiphanes. There's going to be the temple will be rebuilt, and there will be an idol set up in there. I.e. the image of the beast and the Antichrist gives life to the beast and it animates and um, probably uh, will sacrifice unclean animals to it. That's that's my, you know, the futurist interpretation. <laughs> Dude, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that because in one way I feel like the man of sin goes down a whole nother alleyway that we probably don't want to, it'll take up too much. Um, uh, is, uh, whatever, whichever direction you want to go with it. I yeah, mean, this uh, is your show. Conversation, and I'm happy to let you guide it to hit the points that you want to hit for this. Okay. One thing I wanted to say. 
One thing no, I wanted to say, I had a talking I point right on a lot of levels. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, I, I had a talking point really quick. That, that's that's fine because there's a lot of cool stuff yet. There's the Great Tribulation. Yes. Yes. There's uh, the Sun, Moon, and Stars, and then there's the Coming of the Son of Man, which is the, yep. you know the Coming of the Son of Man was the one thing as I was studying this stuff, I could totally start to see how all this was fulfilled uh, in the first century, except the Coming of the Son of Man on the clouds. Surely that cannot be anything but the physical return of Christ, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, there's the other issues right after the abomination. If you if you if we you know want to talk about those. No, no, uh, uh, Frank. Um, I, I think you ought to get ahead to your uh, to your big point there because there's a particular passage I, I know you're going to read from Josephus, and I really do want the audience to hear it because it will shake a lot of people and make them dig into this subject a lot more. Um, you know, so. it's funny. I I actually would not have used that passage. Really? I, yeah, because I, all mine is all scriptural uh, on this particular issue. I do. I think I probably have that that Josephus somewhere, but I don't usually refer to it because there's so many scriptural uh, passages that I don't need to. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, you make a good point that I probably should use it more often because it does fit. <laughs> it's consistent, you know? Yeah. But anyway, let's oh, let's okay. Let's jump right to the coming coming in the clouds. Anyway, we yeah, because that, that's the that's the second. That, uh, and that's probably uh, in many ways the bigger stumbling block because everyone's Absolutely. looking at themselves, going, "Why am I still mortal?" So yes, yes, and that was the one thing that to me just seen clearly that cannot be fulfilled in the first century. So therefore, that again, number one. But if you want to know what something means, if you've got Jesus saying it's. Everything between these bookends, every all these things, not some of them, all these things will be fulfilled in this generation. So therefore, I think we need to interpret, well, what does this mean if, it, if it's interpreted in the first generation? How could that be? And lo and behold, if you go and study the notion of God coming on the clouds in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. you will find a heavily, heavily documented um, uh, uh, understanding that, that brings sense to this. But before we go to the Old Testament, mm -hmm. it's really ironic. That's not the only place Jesus said he's coming on the clouds. Um, and what's interesting is other places in the gospel when he refers to it, it's even more cloud and clear that he's saying it's going to happen right within their life lifespan. So uh, you read Matthew 16, 27 and 28. Jesus is standing before, I think he's before the high priest or whatever, and he's, you know, he's answering their question and he says, for the Son of Man is going to come with the angels and the glory of his Father, and he will repay each according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Right, because they're still alive right now. Yeah, they've lived for 2,000 years. Yeah. But no, but see. So, well, I believe so, that, he, though. <laughs> oh, but but I, I so he's talking to this audience of people and he's saying, look, some of you standing here are not going to die before the Son of Man comes in his kingdom. And then in Matthew 26, 63, he says, Jesus, oh, that I'm sorry, that's when he's before the high priest. And he says, I jure you by the living God, tell us if you're the Christ. And Jesus said, you have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So there's a sense in which, and there's more passages like that. Uh, Jesus in Matthew 10, he says, he's talking to his disciples and he says, you will not have gone through, he goes, they're going to persecute you from one town to one town to, to the next, but just keep going and endure to the end because I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the son of man comes. So this concept of the son of man coming in on the clouds is, is not just in Matthew 24, it's, it's elsewhere that gives this strong impression that he's talking to these people and saying, you're going to see this. You're not, most, some of you are not going to die. You, a lot of you here, you, the high priest, you're going to see this. Um, so how, what could that mean if it's not the second coming, a physical return? Well, how could it be interpreted that way? That's when you, you go into the Old Testament, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go through a bunch of stuff, but I'll just I'll give, you, I'll give you the broad brush, and you know, if you can get the book and see a lot better examples. But mm -hmm. there are many, many examples throughout J the, the Old Testament. We're talking uh, Jeremiah, Psalms, Kings, Exodus. I mean, over and over again, whenever God um, comes in judgment upon a nation or a city, it talks about him coming on the clouds, mm -hmm. right? And so, for example, um, let me see if I can find, find some here. Uh, uh, not very good. Oh, there we go. 
Okay, sorry. Okay, so when God comes, got some in front of me if you if you want me to uh, pull them out real fast. But yeah, I got, got it now. I got it. Okay, cool. so when God comes against Egypt, right in in Ezekiel thirty, this is a, this happened in history in the past. For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations, and a sword will come upon Egypt. In in the prophecy of uh, in Isaiah nineteen one, he's talking about the Ethiopian ruler and the Syrians and Sargon, and he says the oracle concerning Egypt. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. And then when he comes against Assyria, it talks about him coming on the clouds. And so on and on, whenever God judges nations or cities, it, he says he comes on the cloud to judge them. Now, does that mean God was physically on the cloud surfing like, you know, like we, why, like we would picture Jesus would be? No, it doesn't. What it means is it's a spiritual or figurative, whatever word you want to use, a symbolic expression that God is saying, A, coming on the clouds in the ancient world and in the Bible was a sign of deity. And then you do a study on clouds and it's all connected to deity. And B, coming on the clouds is a reference in not only of the ancient world, but in the Bible as well of uh, of, the, of a God judging, judging a city or a nation. So if this notion, and by the way, this isn't just one or two or three, it's like a dozen of these examples. So if this notion of God coming on the clouds in judgment of nations or cities is very popular and well-known within the ancient Hebrew mindset, now take that mindset and listen, be a first century Jew, listen to Jesus. And he says, I'm telling you these Temple's going to be destroyed, and all these things are going to happen, and then I'm going to come on a cloud. And why? Because what did he say in the beginning? You rejected Messiah, so God, I'm going to come and, and destroy your house. It's no longer God's house. I'm going to destroy it. And, and the coming on the clouds is that destruction. It's that judgment coming. So, so in other words, Jesus came in judgment upon Jerusalem in the first century. It's not the same as a physical return of Christ, but it is a coming because God comes many times in the Bible. It's not just one single coming, right? So that's mm -hmm. the that's the big picture context uh, of of how of of how I began to appreciate the more literary poetic nature. Uh, rather than our modern scientific evangelical mind that just comes and literalizes everything. It's ridiculous. And no, that, that sounds too mean. It's, it's just, it's obsessive how, how we automatically literalize everything because we have been, when we've been raised to think scientifically and literally and the, the, you know, the prophetic texts just simply aren't that way. Quite often not. Um, there, there is an, uh, well, no, uh, let me uh, take a different track on that because uh, it, 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 we'll go really deep down rabbit hole if I go the way I was first thinking of. So how, you know, when you've got these references, uh, like, for example, do you disagree with me that when in First Thessalonians 4, uh, 15 through 5, whatever, that Paul is referring to the same event as the uh, Yeshua talking about coming on the clouds? Or do you think that's a different event? Uh, t to be honest, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to uh, back off on that one because that's one of my problem passages that I'm trying to work through. Right okay, now. Cool. And, oh, and awesome. I, I will tell you this: um, most most of the guys in my camp believe mm -hmm. that that's uh, you're talking about First Thessalonians. They argue that that is that actually is the resurrection, and and I think there's some good arguments for that. But I would admit. The language sounds very much similar, and he's writing to the same Thessalonians, so it does seem a little problematic. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how I work it all together, but I would say that most of the guys in my camp that I would probably at least I defer to them. They argue that this is this is the resurrection, so so that is the physical coming of Christ. That's that's how they see it. But you know what? I, I'm not one. I'm not the one to really defend it right now because I'm still working through that uh, that fine. understanding. No, no, that's fine. Um, and I appreciate your honesty on that one. Um, the uh, <laughs> if we uh, turn the tables, you'd find me uh, having similar things. Of uh, I'm working on that part still. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, and, and you know what? That it, that's a wonderful uh, it, place to be because when you're humble enough to say, "I don't know yet. I'm still working," then you're leaving the uh, door open for the Lord to uh, uh, really uh, work yeah. with you on that. Yeah, yeah we um, don't want to be right. We just want to know the truth. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I remember uh, 
it, there's a, a web comic I uh, like, uh, even if I disagree with it sometimes, called uh, XKCD. And uh, in one, um, in, in sort of the tooltip uh, thing he put at the end of uh, one of the, one of his things, he it makes the remark that um, you don't use science to prove you're right; you use science to become right. And I'm, and, and you know, the same thing is true. You don't use the Bible to prove you're right; you use the Bible to become right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Amen. And that means always having to be willing to uh, come, step back and revise and so forth. So that's yep. awesome. Yeah. So, you know, um, just, I was going to say, think of, I was going to uh, say really early on in your book, um, you have these gods and they're talking to each other. Oh yes. Yeah. Let's get into that. It's so cool. Yeah, you know, because you set this well. whole, you know, spiritual, you know, rulers in high places, you know, their schemes and how they're working and how they're thinking. But one of the things that just really stuck out to me and, uh, you know, is, um, the gods are talking to each other and um, they talk about they're talking about one of the churches and one of them says um, that they have lost their first love. They have become a, so obsessed with doctrinal perfection. They no longer engage in works of faith. I just thought that just hit me really hard. We see a lot of that going on today. And, uh, yeah, that's really true. But you know what? If I can use that to launch off onto my own agenda. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> please. No, please. Perfect. No, I, I'm glad you brought that up because one of the premises of, of this story, you guys are divine counsel guys, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. So you get this. But one thing you said, the other listeners may not catch it, was uh, God, I have gods of the nations. Wait, what? Are you saying there's many gods? Well, oh, yeah. one of the premise of my entire series of Chronicles of the Nephilim that I carried over into this is this. Mm -hmm. the, and I mentioned this earlier, you know, but, but, and this was my, this was my personal uh, creative way of doing it. I don't know that this is literally the truth, but it made sense of all the mythology I studied, all the Bible history and everything. And that was this. I said, look, I believe that the you know Bible, Genesis 6, clearly says that there's these fallen sons of God. They come to earth and they're rebellious and all this and, and their activities you know, and maybe and 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 then later on, pagans worship the host of heaven, which is a synonym for not just the stars, but also for these uh, angelic beings and such. So people are worshiping them. And I thought, what if, you know? And I always thought, you know, well, we've got all the we always assume the gods of the nations are just myths, but you know, there's always some truth in every lie, and there's always some, you know, something powerful. A powerful spiritual truth, even behind a, a, a lie, and sometimes it's demonic. And so I said, "Well, what if the gods of the ancient world weren't just myths, but they were actual real beings? But they were these fallen angels or watchers who were masquerading as the gods of the nations in order to get worship away from Yahweh." And I'm like, "It makes it makes sense of everything." And I'm not like I said, I, I'm not saying this is literally what it is, but it sure makes sense of, of things. And then people build myths around it and such. And these fallen beings are also those territorial powers over the nation. So that links up with the, the Bible. And then lastly, you know, with the Bible notion of Deuteronomy 32 worldview. But then lastly, this other element was there are other a couple places, you know, I, I don't have them at my fingertips now, but in Deuteronomy, uh, I'm, I'm, no, actually, I think it is in Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy where God's, yeah, yeah. He, God <laughs> says, he says, you know, or, or Moses is saying, you are sacrificing to these gods of Canaan. You are sacrificing to demons. And it's, it's, a, it's a Hebrew word that I don't know that it means literal demons, but it's demonic. And so Shitty. what if there's a demonic truth, reality to these, these idols and, and beings and behind them, in other words? Oh, yeah, there is, and, too. But but it's a masquerading because they're not really gods like we're conceiving it, of it, right? And so that's the principle that I wrote the whole series. So when you're reading Chronicles of Nephilim, you don't have angels with angel names. You've got the gods of the nations like Baal from Canaan yeah. debating with Asherah and all this. But we know that they're actually the angels masquerading, right? So I carry that over into, the, into Chronicles of the Apocalypse and into the Tyrant. And be, why? Because, uh, you know, they're still around at that time. And so these guys are all 
coalescing around Satan for the big, uh, which what I would argue is the Battle of Armageddon. <laughs> but nevertheless, they're argue they're they're coming down for the big battle, which is going to be ultimately uh, the big battle of the spiritual war and the earthly war is going to be this this war of of the Romans on on the Jews in in Jerusalem, right? And so that's kind of the pinnacle of it all. So I'm I'm showing these gods of the nations and and they're um and they're jockeying for powers because I thought another thing I thought was yeah. we we have we have these. I think just unimaginative, stupid picture. Uh, those of us who believe there are demonic beings and realities and principalities and powers and Satan, right? We believe they're real. Those of us who do. Um, but how, we, we, I think we tend to picture them like they're all in lockstep. You know, they're all just doing Satan's bidding. And I'm like, wait a minute. No evil being that I know that we know of ever operates that way. Yeah, ever, no like way. If you look at the mafia, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a Don. I was going to say. But everyone's, everyone's jockeying for power. Everyone's betraying one another. Oh, yeah. So I said, what if we have these gods, and yeah, they have their authority over the nations, and yeah, they're submitted to Satan because Satan was the was the god of Rome, and since Rome was the, the single power over all the world, Satan was the god of this world, right? So because he's the ultimate power, but that doesn't mean they're not going to be jockeying for power, trying to get, you know, and betraying one another. So I try to tell that kind of story to make it interesting and fascinating, and I start that story in Tyrant Rise of the Beast, but it's going to become much more pronounced as, as the series goes on. So I'm, well, that's one element I'm really excited about. It gives you real insight into how they're thinking and stuff um it gives you an insight into the powers behind what's happening in in, in that period and in, in, in this period for that matter i mean yeah. it's a very good well, it paints a good a, picture let me, uh, let me ask you because i uh, didn't spot it in the dramatis persona but i'm also reading your book on my nook and it's messing up the pictures i'm gonna have to look at it on the full screen later but uh and by the way brian puts a dramatis persona into his books and he gives you pictures so you yeah can, so you can see what he thinks they look like it's awesome yeah it's really um, cool but here's here's the funny thing it's like you know it, everyone's like well you know Satan's not in the Old Testament. It, it doesn't really develop into the intertestamental period and all that. And I disagree because when uh, the um, uh, when the uh, Pharisees are basically accusing uh, Jesus of Satanism, he's like they're like he's casting out demons by the power of uh, Beelzebul. Well, Beelzebul was just a mispronunciation of Belzebul, meaning Baal the Prince. Yep. yep. And he turns right around and says. Wait a minute, if Satan's casting out Satan. So Satan tells us, or Yeshua tells us, that Satan is in fact Baal the prince, yeah. who was the storm god of the uh, of um, pretty much the entire Middle East. The uh, 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 Babylonians worshipped him as Baal, also known as Marduk. But he was also worshipped by the Greeks as Zeus. Oh yeah, yep. The thunder yep. god, who was in turn also worshipped by the Romans as the chief of their pantheon, Zeus Pater, or Jupiter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they literally, the Romans literally had their chief god was in fact uh, uh, was in fact the same god as the Baal of the Old Testament and the Satan of the New. So Yeah, no, amen. amen. Yeah, I believe yeah. these and mythical gods are much closer to reality than we would mm -hmm. like to believe, you know? Yeah. And I, I do think I do think that Satan goes by many different names. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, and again, we're 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 going to be entering into interpretive uh, area here. But nevertheless, um, and I, one of the things, I, as when you're when you're an author and you're trying to be creative, you know, uh, you're also looking for fresh ways of 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 uh, telling stories or whatever. And since Satan does go by different names. I felt like if I'm using the name Satan, it's just sort of, uh, what's the word? It's, it's, um, it's so cliche and everyone has their, their own sort of, uh, you know, picture when they see that word. And I want to, I want to, I want to get them thinking Fred differently. Fred Bajama's pitchfork. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, um, in the book of Revelation, uh, there, there is the, this, um, scholars that I've read, make some pretty good arguments that the angel of the abyss, this is a symbolic uh, reference there, the angel of the abyss in Revelation who releases the demonic locusts and all that kind of stuff. Um, there is some good arguments that he is, that is symbolic of Satan. And so I take that tack 
And uh, it doesn't matter if he isn't, he's still an evil being, right? But anyway, <laughs> I, I, I thought it was a pretty convincing argument since I, I really think that there are lots of symbolic references to Satan and even to Jesus in different terms. Jesus is a lion here, he's a lamb there, right? And so, uh, so in my story, Apollyon, is, is, which is the name or Abaddon in Hebrew, but I, since my story is taking place in the Greek dominated world, uh, he's using the name Apollyon as it is in the book of Revelation. So Apollyon is my, is my Satan character in the story. And I, I kind of thought that was interesting because it gives you a different view of Satan that people, you're going to see him through different eyes because you're not going to have that baggage that you add to it, you know? And the fascinating thing about Apollyon is, is the name is, it also has some possible symbolic connections to Apollos, oh, which, that. <laughs> which happened to be uh, the patron deity of Nero. And for those of you who are wondering, uh, let's get it. Let's just say it right up front. Um, I believe that the beast in the book of Revelation was ultimately Nero. Uh, but of course, the beast is a complex imagery because it's not just a single individual. It's sometimes referred to as the complex entity, which would be the empire or the, actually, I mean the Roman Empire. So sometimes the beast is a reference to the empire. Sometimes it's to the individual. But basically, I see Nero as that beast character. So he's tied in with the fact that if Nero's patron deity was Apollos, and the Apollos was, of course, you know, the sun god and the god of 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 uh, battle and and also of of uh, the lyre and stuff. And he was also a charioteer. And there's all this stuff. Nero was a charioteer. So there's all kinds of all these symbolic connections I bring into the story. So f for those who like really love that kind of stuff, the fantasy type elements or the uh, you know Game of Thrones type connections and things, <laughs> that's all in here. Yeah, it's kind of like and, oh, Thor, or gods do. of Egypt. It gives, it's got that feel to it. Yeah, yeah. And then what I did was... Wait, wait, you referenced Game of Thrones. Which one of your characters is played by Sean Bean? I need to know who dies first. Yes, who <laughs> dies first, indeed. <laughs> the last thing I wanted to say about this was, this, this reminded me of something. Um, one of the things you don't want to do in a novel, because you said this earlier, Mike, you know, I, I, I put pictures of my characters. It's usually a no-no to have pictures of characters because people tend to want to have their own picture in their head. But mm -hmm. I, I like to cast all my novels. So if you go on my website, Gadawa.com, I cast all my novels. You can see all the characters with cool pictures of who they are. And for those who like to have help envisioning the characters, it's a great tool. And for those who don't, just skip over those. But one of the other things that Christians really, uh, really have been appreciating is something that I also did that you should never do, which is I footnote the novel. You never want to footnote a novel because that, you know, that's just not cool. But here's the thing. I'm writing in a controversial realm, Book of Revelation. I've got a minority viewpoint. Most people are going to read this stuff and go, what? That's crazy. <laughs> that can't, where did he, he's making that up, right? And, and, Number two, my fan base has loved the fact that in all my previous novels, I would have a detailed appendixes where I would explain all the biblical and historical research I did that I based the novels on. And Christians have loved that stuff because they like to have things explained. So I knew that, OK, this way I could footnote it for those who want the footnotes, who want to all oh, where did he get this idea or prove it to me? They can check out the footnotes and I have, I have as much footnote text as I have text in the, in the novel because I don't just put citations. I actually take chunks of quotes so that you can kind of get an idea of where I'm drawing all this information from because it's, you know, it, it's going to be so shocking, you know, and <laughs> luckily I think Christians are okay. Christians like to have things explained to them, whereas sometimes other people don't. Uh, so I think it works well for this particular world. <laughs> I think it does too. Actually, um, oh shoot, what am I looking at? Uh, I, I'm actually flipping through the uh, uh, pictures right now. I love the way you've uh, uh, captured all these. Um, <laughs> and it's not just Game of Thrones. I'm like, you know, next thing up, I'm waiting for. Uh, let's see, we got Poseidon here. So uh, we yeah. we've got Zeus, Athena, Poseidon, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman. No. <laughs> <laughs> You could make – have you ever done a graphic novel? Because you would make a really good one. Yeah. Well, I wanted to. I wanted to, but it's near impossible because uh, to find an illustrator, um, if, you're not, if you're not being paid by a company to do it right, you know, you got to do it as a freelancer. You got to do it on consignment or on um, – 
you know, you, you, you split the profits or something. But the problem is, is it, it'll take a year to illustrate a graphic novel. And most illustrators don't want to put that kind of time into it on spec. They, they need to be paid. And I could never pay the amount of money that that would cost to get them to illustrate. I tried in the past because I want this whole series to be, especially this particular series, I would love it to be a graphic novel, but you can't find anyone who's willing to put the uh, commitment into it unless they're getting paid. So up front. Yeah. Well, if I there's any listeners here, to... all the listeners of the Iron Show, maybe there's one of you who would be willing to do that. So get a Contact. hold of Brian. I've got a good friend in Japan who makes a living as a manga car, and I know how much effort he has to put into uh, uh, doing his drafting. So, yeah, uh, there's a yeah. uh, uh, there's definitely a thing there. Oh, my, you actually brought uh, – you broke out the uh, – uh, a la to El Uza and Manat here. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's oh, man, wait till, wait till you see book two. Uh, book two, I go into the Arabian gods, and it's going to be very interesting, the moon god. <laughs> oh, yeah, that will uh, be, that will be that, really eye-opening. That, you're going to get killed before you get around to doing book three. I mean, come on. Well, <laughs> well you notice I don't have a picture of Allah on there, so I yeah. only have a picture of Kubal. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you'd it, have to it, move it, in it, stealth it on that one. Get more safe there. <laughs> yeah, move in, move in stealth, Brian. Move in stealth. Yes. Besides, I'd argue that you do have a picture of him. It's just further up the page. Anyway, the... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to get in, uh, in trouble here. Anyway, no, the... <laughs> A lot of us, a lot of us are audio oriented. I learn everything on audio. My Bible is on my iPod. Everything. It's just all audio for me. Uh, pretty much all your books are audio right now, aren't they? Yes, um, I read them myself, and I'm I'm really good because I know the material, and uh, I'm I'm uh, well. As you can see, I'm I can be very dramatic and emotional and such. So it's not boring reading. And uh, the, the audio book of Tyrant, Rise of the Beast, will be out with, I hope, within a month or so. Um, I'm working on that right now. Uh, but, yeah, I record every one of them onto audio because I've been amazed at how many people love reading audio books. And it's, it, it's half of my income is from my audio books. So hmm. it's good. Oh, yeah, especially as we approach these end times. Audio is definitely. <laughs> 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 Ooh, I got you with that one. I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. Oh, hey, yeah. Working at, when I was working in, in the city, uh, audiobooks were a lot of how I kept up on things, and that and podcasts. Uh, so, yeah, yeah uh, for those of us who have, like, busy lives with our children needing attention when we get home, yeah, they, they are immensely helpful. So, it's so great to put in – so great to put a Brian Gadawa book on your iPod and then go mow the lawn, you know, or pull the weeds or, you know, go for a drive or, you know, or for that matter, uh, go to work and drive your forklift with uh, Brian. Next thing you know, yeah. you're, you know, free, you're mowing your neighbor's neighbor's lawn because <laughs> you just got some raptor with the book. <laughs> and you're swinging the grass shears like a giant sword. Ah. <laughs> oh, yeah. By the way, that's a, yeah. That for those of you who are wondering, because of my Hollywood background, that I bring a screenwriter's mentality to my novels, and so um, I'm very action oriented. I, I, my goal is if every chapter or scene isn't interesting in some way or fascinating or has some twist or you know every every scene isn't an action scene but i have a lot of action and I, the pace is fast because i get bored i have add because i love movies right so i yeah. bring that visual <laughs> world to the to the books and people have said uh you know yeah it reads like you're watching a movie and so mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of the the tack i take it really yeah, does it and when i'm reading it i'm there i can see the scenery you know it's like i can smell the smells it's like it's that's a huge that's an incredible talent to be able to put put the reader there it's a uh, it, it's kind of a rare thing and you do not go into descriptions like a lot of flowery descriptions you know yeah you yeah just... i don't like that basically i wrote for myself i'm like uh, that stuff bores me. It gets me hung up. I try to paint yeah. a, a broad picture so you kind of get the feel. Uh, and uh, so, you know, those of you who are literatis and snobs, you, you might not like it. But uh, <laughs> those of us normal people, you, you, they've been loving it. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Literatis and snobs uh, often forget that, you know, Shakespeare, who's considered highbrow literature today, was basically the Quentin Tarantino of his day. Amen. A zillion. Amen. Go, and if you don't believe me, go find an annotated copy of Shakespeare that explains all the in-jokes and pop culture references 
and <laughs> from the very yes, true. Yes, here. You know, one thing I noticed reading Tyrant is that you kind of you you really write a um, presentist view of the fall of Satan into your um, book. And I don't know for those who don't know these advanced theological terms. Um, like a presentist would believe that um, when Jesus said, I've seen Satan fall like lightning, he was talking about then, right then. Now there's, you know, there, there's been debates going on throughout the centuries with the great minds. Uh, was he talking about, was he projecting uh, Satan falling like lightning from heaven back to the proto-evangelion, like in the garden? Or was he talking about present tense, uh at his time right then or was he projecting that into the future into the end times when satan finally falls forever and uh, you know a lot of people take the the view that jesus was talking about then and you write that into the to the to the tyrant it's kind of written in there really strongly i know, do you want to address that at all or uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I acknowledge that that chapter, again, that uh, we're, we're talking Revelation. So, uh, you know, it, there's definitely different views of that. But I get a lot of my initial interpretation of that more from the Gospels, like particularly John, you know, where Jesus talks about, you know, he's, you know, when he was casting out the demons, you know, he says, well, if I if I cast out demons by Satan, uh, right, you know, uh, but I cast them out by the kingdom of God, then then know that that kingdom of God has come. And I bound the strong man, you know, I can, you, I bind the strong man, you know? Mm-hmm. And so he, his, and there are other places where he talks about how uh, Jesus in, in John talks about how um, he says, you know, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And he also talks about different references to, I don't, I don't have them at the, my fingertips, you know, but I do, it is, I guess you would call it the presentist. I, I believe that when Christ came, um, uh, that was when, when uh, Satan, had a falling meaning Satan until that point in time, Satan was, you know, the, the old Testament notion was the Satan means the adversary, the accuser, and he's called the accuser of the brethren. Uh, and that until the new Testament, new covenant kingdom, until, until Messiah, um, the, the Satan could accuse before the throne of God. But when Christ comes, he's literally cast out of the throne because why? Because the blood of Christ uh, completely covers the sins of his people so there can be no more accusation. So the Satan is now out of heaven. He can't accuse the brethren anymore. And that's the falling from, from heaven. And he, he says something else about like the God, of, I tell you, the God of this world is cast out. I cast him out, you know, that kind of thing. So there's this sense in which Satan is still around, but He's lost his power to accuse the brethren, to uh, to blind the world, to the you know, like all the nations were blinded until uh, Christ comes, and now all people from all nations and tribes ca- through cr- come to into the kingdom of God through Christ. In other words, uh, all those nations that were under the authority of the sons of God. Jesus, as Messiah, has taken back the territorial rights, the real estate, so to speak, the the territorial rights, and now he owns owns the whole world, and that's what allows people from every tribe and nation to be saved, because um, Christ is now that that um, superior authority. If that makes any sense, yeah, that's and, and your that's and, the picture I'm operating with. Yeah, and also in your book, Tyrant, um, you also kind of uh, you kind of illustrate how. Uh, the um, the legal rights of the gods, and they talk about you know their own legal rights. That seems to be yes. really big in the supernatural realm, doesn't it? Yeah, because you know where that comes from is again that goes back to the Deuteronomy thirty two passage because. Uh, and this concept of inheritance is a very, very important one uh, throughout the whole Old Testament. Um, the word inheritance in Deuteronomy 32, 8 through 10, God talks about how the uh, um, the um, nations are under the sons of God as their inheritance, but God has Jacob for his inheritance. So, uh, and, and not only that, but also the land of Israel throughout the Old Testament is Israel's inheritance as well. So there's a, you know, there's this notion of the land and the territory inheritance but with the God. And so, um, and, 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 and with the new, uh, what am I thinking? Oh, okay. So, so the idea of the inheritance is, this notion that the gods have the territorial rights, so therefore I'm depicting it legally, uh, spiritually legally, if you want to use that term, right? As if they have 
God, literally, God gave them that right. They have it. Oh, yeah. But then he, he takes it away because that's the point of Messiah. Messiah takes it back and says, okay, now I've got the territory rights to the whole earth because I'm Messiah. And I'm taking it back away from you. And, and that's their inheritance. So they no longer will have that inheritance. Now they have it. It's been taken away legally in the new covenant, but it still has to work itself out in history. Right. And that's mm-hmm. where, where you're going to see more of that happening. Yeah. So really, like the difference between uh, issuing a uh, um, eviction notice and then having the police actually show up to haul the people off. Oh, interesting. Absolutely. And by the way, this is where this is where uh, you 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 and I would have similarities because I do hold to a certain concept of the now and the not yet, meaning that there yeah. are very scriptural pref- uh, a lot of scriptural notions where it's 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 now and not yet. For example, like we talked about this earlier, you know, the new Jerusalem has come. The new covenant is the new heavens and earth. But it's not yet consummated. It's inaugurated, but not consummated. It's here, but not full. Jesus Christ rules on the throne of God's right hand in heaven right now. That's what Ephesians says. He rules over all authority, over everything. Yet Paul uh, Paul or whoever it is in Hebrew says, yet we do not yet see. All things are under his feet, yet we don't see all things under his feet. Uh-huh. Which means that spiritually, and legally, what's that? I was just going to say, and we're still warring against powers and principalities. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yes. So, yeah, there is. I agree. There's a now and a not yet. Probably where I would diverge is is. Uh, and again, because this comes down to, uh, unfortunately, for people, for those who want absolute certainty and absolute systems that give all answers, uh, that's the truth is ultimately not like that. And there is there is gray areas. And so so I would I would admit that there are. There are notions and things in the in the Bible that I would agree prophetically have these sort of echoes, or you might call them uh, repetitious fulfillments, um, cycles, cycles, maybe, yeah, but, themes. But, I, but there, but you would also have to admit it's not that's not absolute either, because of course. Uh, I, I hope you don't believe that there's going to be another Messiah born in Bethlehem. Uh, so no. in other words, <laughs> uh, we, we all have to have these, okay, well then what's our rule? How do we know what, which ones are repeatable and which ones aren't? And that is a, admittedly a gray area. And I'll, I'll give you that, but I definitely, um, uh, I definitely have that now and the not yet. I've actually been working on that for a bit, and I, I've been uh, throwing up some uh, things on my own blog uh, along those thoughts. I got derailed because I started dealing with somebody's questions about Genesis, but just looking at, okay, how does the New Testament use prophecy? And I think that, you know, not just what prophecies it cites, unfortunately, some do take a very narrow view that, you know, interpreting the Old Testament lie of the New means that we only pay attention to the prophecies that the New Testament gave, but and when it comes to eschatology and that kind of thing. But um, we find that quite often there are prophecies that had sort of that partial fulfillment in the past where, you know, it's like good enough for government work. And yet there's a there are just a couple of details that just don't fit. And I think that it, until those details do fit, then the and then the cycle continues. To to give like one of the easiest examples I can think of, um, you've got the whole thing with Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac, mm-hmm. and uh, Isaac says, uh, you know, wait, 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 uh, Dad, you seem to have forgotten something. Where's the lamb? And Abraham says, God will provide himself a lamb. Yep. Well, God does provide a substitute for Isaac, but he provides a ram. Now, same species, right? Good enough for yeah. government to work. But was it really like that difficult for God to actually provide what Abraham had prophesied? He had to provide? <laughs> and the answer is no. This is telegraphing that this ram is merely a placeholder. There is another lamb, another per- another one called the lamb, who is the final substitute for Isaac. And then, you know, okay, now what do you do with that? And you start going through and looking at all the places where the lamb comes up, and you end up with the Passover. Hmm, shockingly enough, Yeshua died on Passover. Yeah. Uh, you, start get, you start getting to the uh, uh, Isaiah 53 prophecy and so forth and so on. And so to me, that, that's the reason I bring up things like the abomination and certain other prophecies. It, it if you've got a fulfillment that that covers the scope, and you clearly do when it comes to Hobbit discourse, you you have clearly identified that this covers the scope, and yet there's those little details, the abomination of desolation, the connection to the resurrection that hasn't happened yet, and so forth, that just leave us going, ah, yeah, but I can't make this fit. And I think that when it hits the final cycle, 
everything will absolutely fit, including the whole thing of this generation, because that phrase, as you know, and because you've argued on both sides of this, can also mean this people or this uh, race. And so the and so the idea that Israel will never pass away until all is fulfilled is also embedded in that. And that's why I, I think that you're absolutely correct. You're just but that there are a couple of things that yeah. um, aren't coming up in this particular book because of the angle you think on it. That's yeah, you know, it's. I would be happy if I could. I, I would be happy to to convert people to your viewpoint using my books because that's halfway there to my viewpoint. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's kind of like it's yeah. full preterists love us partial preterists because they're getting other people halfway to their full preterism, right? And that's kind of how I'm seeing the situation. Look, yeah, I, I actually do not do have a different view on that with uh, Ghanaia and what Ghanaia means and stuff, but mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. I'd be okay if people would just come to the conclusion, okay, you know, maybe it's not all future after all. Um, I can see how this was fulfilled in the first century. Oh, I still believe it might be fulfilled in the future. If I could get them that far from the extreme end that I see most people are in, which is this is all future and we're going to have microchips and the beast and the antichrist. You know, if I could get them out of that to starting to realize, wow, a lot of this has relevance to the first century. I still believe it has relevance to the future. I'd be, I'd be happy with that because uh, that that's enough for me at this point that, you know, I'm not trying to convert people to my view. I'm trying to just sort of open their eyes to a, a fresh way of seeing things that, that might, help them switch their understanding a little bit, you know? It's not I, about conversion for me, necessarily. I have no, to I ask, though, where do, you, where do you see us in the timeline? Ah, <sighs> well... I mean, that, that begs the question. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, so basically, here's... I'm going to get into... Let, let me mention a little bit of, of, of the psychology of it, you know? And again, this this may not be your school, but the school that I came out of, you know, that, that I see as the most dominant and strong one is the strong futuristic extreme view of, of obsessed with just what, basically what I call newspaper exegesis. <laughs> uh, they're, yeah. they're, they're concerned with finding... And the what's... doctor's rising from the abyss! <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. This event that just happened with Donald Trump and Russia is yeah. this prophecy. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing that I see a lot of going on. Yeah. And, and, and so, but what I think that is here, you know, and, and this is subjective, but because I was in that camp, I believe that's driven by a desire to feel significant. We want to be significant to God and there's nothing more significant to go. God is moving right now. We are the last generation. We're important because we are the last generation that's going to see these things. Yeah. We're important to God because of that. But if you take that away, like, you know, when I started exploring Matthew 24 and all that, my, one of my first reactions was, oh, my gosh, if this isn't what I thought it was, then what do I have to look forward to? There's nothing, <laughs> right? It's like, no, no, because think about this. You are not significant because you are Elijah, because you are the generation that crossed the Red Sea and saw no. What about all these you know, millennia where Christians just lived and died? No one no heard about them except they, they honored God. They served him in his kingdom. You know what I'm saying? And they just served God. And that's, that should be enough. Our significance is from being a, a small part, uh, or as I put it, one small brick in this spiritual temple of God that God is building. That's what he says in Ephesians, right? And he's building this holy temple unto the Lord. Each of us is one little brick. And it's it's... It's a pride crusher when you go, that's all I am is a little brick, but I wanted to be the Holy of Holies, you know? It's like, but that's okay because that's that's how God operates. It's enough to be excited about his kingdom and about what he's doing in his people and through his people and to try to rescue others from, you know, from this, the hell that they're going towards and all that kind of stuff. And and I'm like, that that is powerful enough for me. Now, at, there's more to it than that. that we're in a saying. significant time, regardless of your, uh, regardless of your exact prophetic view, simply because yeah. we're coming darn close to the Great Commission being fulfilled. There are a relative handful of people groups that um, have not been reached. There are more that you know really need to have the Bible translated for them and that kind of bit. But yes. we're living in a really exciting time. You know, for for the people out there that are listening to this and uh, are concerned about, it, hey, you know what? You, be part of the final race. I mean, I grew up in the Christian Missionary Alliance. I didn't grow up in a Messianic synagogue or a, or a traditional one. I grew up in the Christian Missionary Alliance. I've always been excited about missions. I've always been excited about 
translating the Bible, not just in terms of words, but in terms of concepts to, to other people. So it's kind of how I got into, you know, this mess. Uh, you know, we, regardless of whether, you know, like it's five years away or 50 or what have you, there's a job to do. And you're yes. in an excellent time to be part of that job. It, you know, with the communications we have today, you can be part of that job, like practically up close and personal and particularly yes. feel the calling to go. Amen. And I guess that's what I'm saying is find our significance in being a part of that great work that God is doing, no matter how evil the world is getting around you, mm -hmm. you know, because that's where our significant is. Significance is, you know, we shouldn't be spending our energies looking for the Antichrist. We should be looking for the Christ, you know? <laughs> and so that's, that. It's, it's a matter of focus. And, and all I'm saying is, yeah, that's that's where I think we should be, no matter what view we have. I totally agree with you on that. I've always maintained there are retarded citizens sweeping the church floor that are going to be in a lot higher place in heaven than me. So, mm. so. One of yeah. my friends and I, a long time ago, were speculating on why churches could be healthy for a long time and then fail. And our, our uh, theory was that in every successful uh, church, you had... Uh, some little old lady who was just quietly there walking with the Lord and praying for the place and that nobody stepped into the gap when she died and the place became uh, uh, vulnerable to the powers and principalities who proceeded to take it apart. Yeah, and they yeah. say nothing's and, more and, powerful. And that, said, than... it, it, that so often it's hanging on the one person or, yeah. or whatever. Yes. Or oh, yeah. Just to I be part you. of the link in that chain is like everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's giving up the pride, the pride of place. Like we all want to be, you know, I got to say, you know, cause I was raised in the Billy Graham generation, you know, and I, I love Billy Graham and stuff, but, yeah, me too. but, but it's like, we tended to, you know, make celebrities to the point where like, you know, well, actually I was a big Keith Green fan and uh, talk about guilt, guilt uh, monger there, but, but I love the guy, but it, it was all about, you know, like, you know, you're comparing yourself to all these, these, People who God have, has given special gifts to, and like, well, gosh, I'm not getting a lot of people saved in my life. There must be something wrong because I'm, I'm not, I don't have a Billy Graham ministry or whatever, you know. And I'm like, no, <laughs> Been there. I mean, the Billy Grahams are 0.001%, yeah. 99.9% are normal people just serving God and trying to love people and bring Jesus to them. Can't you be satisfied with that? Why do you have to be a celebrity or you feel like you're not being used by God? You know, get over yourself. And that's well, what I had. Billy Graham had like dozens of counselors, you know, hundreds sometimes, ready to go when, you know, they, they saw people praying. And he always coordinated with the local churches to make sure that the people that came to faith that night had a place to go. Yeah. Okay. yeah. He needed a whole vast network they spent years building up. And yes, yeah. he was a lot of times the one that, you know, sat there and gave people that final push. But as Yeshua said, hey, you know, sometimes one person plants the seed and our person waters and our person uh, harvests. And, you know, I will add to that and someone else has to go along and, you know, thresh the grain. You know, it, it's it, you, you know, it, the fact that you've got the one person who's famous doesn't mean that there aren't a whole lot of other people who are taking part in that harvest. And guess what? In God's eyes, those people are every bit as important as Billy Graham. Absolutely. Absolutely. All parts of the body are just as important. And I just happen to be the armpit of the body of Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the flaky, fungusy toenail. Oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, though, if you are absolutely doing absolutely nothing for Jesus, maybe you should probably think of some way you could do yes. something. Yes, yes. You know. If all you're doing is sitting around going through the newspaper and trying to find the latest fulfillment of prophecy, well, first off, I promise you, <laughs> it, you know, for those of you who are young and doing this, you will get burnt out with it. I know because I started this whole thing in the 90s, and of course, you know, everyone's making a big deal about the year 2000. Nothing yep. happened. 2007, nothing happened. 2012, nothing happened. It burns you out dealing with everyone's next prediction about what's going to happen in the next two years, okay? okay. By all means, study prophecy because that's God's word. But yeah. don't let that keep you from living life, occupying until he comes and doing the job that he has called you to do. Yeah. Amen. I mean, yeah. that's that's the best note that we can end on. You yeah. Know? And we'll <laughs> I, also – I, I want to I recommend people uh, go to YouTube and um, – Find late great planet Earth. Uh, it's it's the it's the movie that Hal Lindsey made in oh, yeah. 1969 or whatever. No, 73. Yep. And it's got like uh, uh, what's his name narrating it? Um, uh, Citizen Kane. Um, oh, or yeah, uh, Orwell. Seriously, no, I didn't realize that. Well, wait, what's his name? George Orwell. 
no, no, it, not Orwell. Um, I'm sorry. Um, uh, darn it, I know this. I can't think of e. it. E.G. Marshall? No. No, 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 no. <laughs> he was cool, Orson though. Wells. Orson Welles. Orson Welles, thank Orson you. That's Wells why I was that's, that's near that's him, but Orwell, yes. It's really instructive because when you look at it, he was saying, you know, Christ was, basically he was, he was thinking Christ was going to come before 1988. He right. 88, 88. Yep. Video and just see how it's all wrong now, you know. And all I'm saying is, it's it's very instructive to make you very very cautious about spending so much time on something that's just going to be a waste of time and, and proven wrong, and and like you know, and which gets us back to the conclusion that I think we've kind of all you know been narrowed in on, which is, you know, the priority our priorities should be. Uh, you know, um, engaging in the kingdom of God and the works of the kingdom of God. Yeah, be aware of what's going on in the world around you. But I'm saying keep your priorities uh, focused on uh, the kingdom of God and, you know, bringing Jesus to people, bringing his compassion to people and bringing his gospel truth to save them out of their their lives, you know, out of their their self-imposed sin, you know. And that's the that's the that's the glory of Christianity of the kingdom, not uh, the big explosive, you know, we're living in a Marvel movie, sci you know, science fiction Marvel movie. That's not as exciting to me as seeing someone give their life to Christ. You know, it just, it blows me away. Oh, yeah. Like when I, I watched a guy uh, get baptized by Russ Dizdar in the swimming pool. That was cool. That was like the coolest <laughs> thing I ever saw in my life. <laughs> um, um, this is an awesome book, you know. Um, Brian Gadawa, Tyrant. I mean, if you don't even like reading books, you will like this book. So, um, I would er encourage you. You can get. There's no excuse for you not to have this book because it is available on any kind of format you could possibly imagine, and it's available in. Is it available in hardcover? No, uh, it's paperback. Yeah, paperback. so if you go to Amazon, paperback and uh, Kindle. Um, uh, but actually, uh, I I forgot that this is also available on iTunes and Kobo. Oh yeah. So uh, yeah, you can track it down. There are so many but different if you, ways. If you have any questions, go to Gadawa.com and click on Chronicles of the Apocalypse. And I've got all kinds of cool stuff, like we were talking about pictures and stuff, but also the links to buy it, to buy it wherever you want to buy it. And a um, lot of a lot of cool stuff, as well as free scholarly articles and free books online that you could get that deal with all the research that I've been doing. So the, I, I made it a point to make my website to be a very, very helpful tool, f free for those who are interested in, in learning more and growing in these areas. Yeah, and everything can be found from that portal. That is Godawa.com. That's G-O-D-A-W-A. 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 That's Godawa.com. All right. Hey, dude, it's been awesome hanging with you. We got to do really it again. Has. <laughs> it's some Thank somebody you. on the West Coast, man. Oh, I have to ask you, um, what's your favorite color? Uh <laughs> red. Well, do you like biscuits and gravy? No. Oh no! That's okay. I forgive you. All right. You oh yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, I want to thank Bruce Collins. The Iron Show is on the Fringe Radio Network at the behest of Bruce Collins. I want to thank God, producer Rick for uh, building the Fringe Radio Network. And guess what? Guess what? Me and Rabbi Mike now own the Fringe Radio Network. Ah, and we're looking for shows. So uh, hit us up. See if We'll see if we like you or not. So, uh, yeah, hit us up. That is FringeRadioNetwork at gmail.com. All right, I want to thank all the listeners uh, for, for uh, almost eight years of Iron Show history, uh, which can be found at ironshow.com, going back into the very ancient of times, and then also at fringeradionetwork.com, where you can hear all of our live archives. All right, hey, till next time, remember, Johnny loves you.
I love that how I've got like 